Well, you'll never believe this. It's still January for one more day. January 69th. We have uh, made it. February is tomorrow. Good morning, everybody. Ben and Woods, 97.3 The Fan. My God. My God. What a long, long start to 2024. Been a pretty decent start, though, I will say. Um, great to be here with you this morning. It is our honor, our privilege uh, to be here on this radio station broadcasting to you, for you, with you. Uh, I'm Woodsy. That's Paul Rindle. He's the executive producer. Good morning, Paulie. Good morning. And uh, Benjamin Higgins, your friendly neighborhood sports anchor, joins us as well. Good morning, Benjamin. Good morning. You know, I was thinking about your January blues or just how long it seems to be stretching yesterday. And what I realized is January is kind of the only month without baseball. And I say that because yeah, in November, you know, the World about, Series stretches into November and you're December. Still- well, December has the winter meetings, and and that seems and to- Christmas and that and Christmas. <laughs> There's all but kinds of good. It, it kind of focuses our attention a couple of times. We have some time off in December, and we have those winter meetings that at least we think something's going to happen. We so it kind of gets ourselves us excited about it. January can obviously have trades and free agent signings. This month was pretty Sleep. pretty quiet yeah. about them, which means it's really the one month that you've got nothing out of the 12 yeah. in the year know, for baseball 25% fans. of the month, we are at Fantasy Camp. That's true. With major Padres interviews yeah, and stories. Yeah, that's true. We have that, that at least. But, uh, no, man, it's just – it's. <clears throat> I, I'm usually uh, kind of a jerk the month of, of January. I, I was doing pretty well, uh, doing pretty well until I'd say last night slash this morning. Um, just a you know bad day, bad night. It happens. I'm I'm very much very much looking forward to uh, going to my, see my therapist today because I feel bad for her. She's probably not going to get a word in edgewise. Just put a big bucket on your desk and let me just vomit words into it for 45 minutes because that's exactly what I'm going to do. A lot of people hate January, though. They do. They, they do dry <laughs> January. They do Well, why New make January resolutions? worse? I cannot get my camera to work in the right way here. Um, no, they do the, the – they try to stick to their resolutions. They do dry, dry January. It's just a tough – it's just a tough month. And, you know, somebody was making the point on another radio show. I think it might have been Stern. They were talking about, um, they're like, you got all this cool stuff in November. You got Thanksgiving and, and there's football. And then December comes and it's the hubbub of Christmas and your you know family and everything else. And they said it's all arbitrary. And then you hit January and it's like a vast wasteland of nothing and that's what you get in uh, in the month of january but yeah i'm i'm going to go see her today i haven't been in a while i had to to skip it last week um to do something with my kids but i mean that poor lady today she's i'm just going to walk in and she's going to be like oh god it's this is what it, it's going to be today. Just blah, 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 just vomiting all over her desk. December's a very indulgent month. Oh, because you, you feel so good. Parties and, and uh, you know, presents. Yeah. And you, there's treats all over the Treat. place. The, everywhere you turn, there's, oh, what is it, a little cookie? Oh, well, Which, and our therapist is going to be like, ah, oh, I should have went to business school. Yeah, dude, she's going to really hate <laughs> her and I think life hum, today. Human nature is uh, you want to balance that out. So January is a very austere month. Yes, a very. Compared to the. You know, indulgent month of December. Let's tuck it in. Let's just get it together and, and try pro- to come out of the gate. My hot. proposal is let's have January be like February the twenty eighth day month. Yes, and make put thirty one days in February. I'm more than fine with that. More than fine with, or just you know what, just split it up a little bit. Just make it to thirty and twenty nine or so. I don't know. Like let's average them together. But uh, man, I was dying last night. I, uh, my little guy, Bo, his, he loves to watch movies. He loves, loves movies. And look, I'll be honest. I'm running out of, running out of appropriate ish movies (laughs) that we can watch. He, he doesn't, he's never like, dad, can we watch cars? You know what I mean? Like, he's like, Oh, I, that's Robert De Niro. What's that? I'm like, you can't watch that one. That was the Joker. That would scare you to death. So he really loves the movie Meet the Parents. He loves it. He thinks it's so <laughs> funny. He probably doesn't understand half of it, but he thinks Ben Stiller. Good taste. He thinks Ben Stiller's the funniest dude alive. He thinks De Niro's amazing. So we watched it, and it struck me uh, last night. Do you guys? Well, you're gonna get what I'm saying. I think because I was scrolling through Netflix and, like I said, the Joker was on there. I have nipples, Greg. Could you milk me? And I looked at the Joker and I went, "Oh God! Like what a what a villain that that character was." You think about 
Hannibal Lecter, right? Just, oh, God, just terrifying. And then I'm watching Meet the Parents, and I go, I think maybe the worst movie villain that I've ever seen, no one plays it better because it, it comes out of left field, is Pam. <laughs> Pam Burns <laughs> from Meet the Parents is maybe the worst movie villain. The fiancé. The fiancé. She's maybe the worst villain of all time. I've never seen a man set up for failure more than Greg Fokker. Ever. Gaylord Fokker. Ever. I'm watching the movie and I go, she's, I just popped my head. I go, she kind of sucks. And then as I watch, I go, mm, no, she really sucks. And then by the end, I'm like, she's the worst, Greg. Get on that plane. <laughs> don't answer the phone. Sell that ring. And don't ever come back. Don't ever come back. I'm watching this and I'm going. So I, I, it popped into my mind. I actually went to Reddit to see if anybody had my same theory. <laughs> oh, yeah, they did. I'm not the only one in the world with this. Here's the, the five months ago, somebody posted, Pam set Greg up for failure at every single turn and meet the parents. And I went, yeah, yeah, she really did. She crushed him. Think about it for a second. How unfair. First, telling her parents he hates cats. Right off the shoot. Oh, don't worry. Greg won't be playing with Jinxie. He hates cats. <laughs> I don't hate cats, Pam. I just have to be more of a dog person. Her dad staring a hole through him when, when <laughs> she says he hates cats. Also, here's a tip. You're living with Greg in Chicago. You're living together. You're clearly having intercourse. And you're going to – you you don't tell Greg your dad was in the CIA. You let Greg think that he's a – florist so that greg is like i got a great idea i'm gonna go spend a grand on this jerusalem tulip and your dad's not gonna have the foggiest <laughs> idea <laughs> Jerusalem <Pooly Pooly. laughs> oh yeah the jerusalem and i'm sitting there watching greg and you know yeah you get those cold sweats when oh, something's yeah. going terribly wrong it's happened on the show a few times you're watching greg just die he's dying and there's pam like throwing an anchor at him every time every time he starts to drown she's like here hold this cinder block and i'm watching this going She's the worst. She's the worst partner I've ever seen Dude, in my life. Uh, I mean, I, there, the list is very long. It's Paul, like I could do an hour on it. I'm not kidding. letting him sleep in <laughs> when the whole family's having breakfast downstairs. He stumbles down in, and he's in his uh, his pajamas, pajamas messy ugh. hair. And he's like, "Why wouldn't you wake me up?" She goes, "I thought I'd let you sleep." He goes, "Now what am I guessing somebody's house? What am I a teenager? You thought you'd let me sleep? <laughs> Get me up if the family's having dinner together." <laughs> Get me up, Pam. Oh, my God. Yeah, it says uh, she sends him to Denny's room for clothes without introducing him. Walk your ass upstairs with him and be like, Denny, okay, here's Denny's thing. Here's some clothes. What is this? Like, she just lets the guy flounder. He's just on the dock floundering, just dying the whole time. And I'm sitting there watching it going. No, no. Greg is afraid of the yeah, ball. Yeah, Greg is afraid of the ball. She's partners up with her uh, ex fiance. He's she it was a stupid sexual thing. Yeah, she tells him. He goes, "I didn't know you and Kevin were that close." She goes, "Oh no, it was just a sexual thing." He's like, <laughs> "Are you kidding me? She's the worst villain I've ever seen in any uh... movie." I would rather have coffee with Hannibal Lecter in his full mask <laughs> than date her, Pam. And, and what makes that movie work is that. <sighs> Greg is not a buffoon. No. He actually is a fairly... S solid as a rock. Solid, you know, he gets it guy, and yet you squirm the entire time for him. Oh, yeah. There's not and a moment in that movie where you're not, like, crawling in your skin yeah. because of what he's going through and in that movie. And most of the things that she's putting him through, she knew. To, she, she could have easily said, hey, my dad's in the CIA. All right, his I'm cover. Not really supposed to even. I'm say not supposed this, to say anything. You need to know this. But, going into his house. Yeah, going in. You know, he's gonna he's gonna mess with you infinitely. He's, he's just, got a lie detector. Just wear it, right? I mean, she sets that cat up for failure the whole time. She let her whole family standing out there laughing at him because his name is Gaylord Fokker, and she just sits there. She thinks he, you know, lied about the M cats and everything. And I'm like. Bro, that guy's one of the most solid. He deserves so much better than Pam. So much better. Bro, the list is, it, 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 it's oodles. Long. I mean, there's a there's hundred things that she did where you look at it and go, yeah, bro, run for the hills. Should have never married her. And then you see Sweet me. Sweet setup, Ice Man. Yeah. Sweet setup, Ice Man. Hey, thanks, Maverick. 
Are you kidding? Why don't you guys <laughs> just make just, out like, in the pool? Over his shoulder, like, He's just getting worn cool, out, cool. man. So I watched that last <laughs> night, and you know, listen, cautionary tale to my my son Bo, right? Don't don't take that ass, man. Find some find somebody better than that. <laughs> Oh, man, it just killed me. Killed me. You know, a hot take, but a defensible one after you laid out the argument. I think so. I really do. Not the traditional movie villain, but that's pretty bad. (laughs) She's terrible. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Just Just letting the guy just twist in the wind for the entire movie, man. So, great movie, uh, but lessons to be learned, uh, to be sure. Who's your more traditional, like, movie villain, not the uh, hot take, like... You're the scariest. Lecter. <laughs> I mean, fascinating. Fascinating villain. But you almost cheer for him a little bit. It's though. very weird. Isn't that, that weird? You, Don't you? When you watch that movie, a you, little bit, you're cheering for him? A little bit. I think outside of Pam Burns, I would go with, I'd go a different route than like the Joker, Hannibal Lecter, like the scarier villains. Christoph Waltz's role in Inglorious Bastards. I've heard yeah, people say that complete one. Complete sociopath. Hans Landa, I think. Yeah. I mean, dude. That's a good one. One of the best acting performances I've ever seen where you're like, I am genuinely oh. creeped out by your presence and everything about this character. He didn't have a scary mask. He wasn't, you know, chopping people's heads off or anything like that. It wasn't was Freddy m- Krueger. He was murdering, well, like, yeah. But <clears throat> he was just, it was almost like killing him with kindness in a creepy way. Jeter nails it. He nails it for me, too. I, I had forgotten about this, mostly because I had to block it out of my mind for terror and fear. But uh, Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men. I don't know that no. I've ever had a more visceral, visceral reaction in a theater to seeing a villain pop on screen, his creepy page boy haircut, and then his like, flip a coin, flip a coin, heads or tails, heads or tails. It's unreal. Yeah, that people will say like horror movie characters. They're now, all. I mean, I you know they're all scary, sure. but you know they're almost parodies because they're so over the top scary. Although Pennywise, the clown, scary as hell. That <laughs> one was scary to me, but I think. I think your age has something to do with it. Yeah. Uh, a, a movie character now that you would almost see as comical when you're younger is terrifying. And for me, it was the uh, the Gestapo agent in Raiders of the Lost Ark, the one... The one who gets his face melted? Yeah, the one who gets yeah. his face melted yeah. off I at the end. I stopped watching... I couldn't watch that movie. It was Major, so scary. Major Tot, I think it was named. Yeah. Air Mac. Uh, <laughs> He he always terrified me. Yeah, I mean, all of those hello, are... Frau, all, hello, Frau. Hello, Frau Lein. <laughs> so <laughs> scary. So and then, scary. For, you know, for like a seven-year-old watching Raiders in the Lost Ark, he was the scariest let's put, it, let's put it this way. If Pam and Greg were near the Ark, Pam would have made Greg open the Ark so that his face would melt and he would die. <laughs> Just the worst. And he shouldn't have never uh, married her. If you saw Meet the Fockers... Did you see her bangs that she was rocking in the the second of Meet the in Meet the Fockers the sequel? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you should have. Well, it's your fault. You should have turned tail when you had a chance and found a nicer lady. Chicago's full of them. Could have found another one. Drop of hat. Successful, handsome, built, right? male nurse. I mean, you 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 absolutely spit the bit on that one, Fokker. But uh, yeah, and, M- and McKee says the uh, the his character in No Country for Old Men scared me so badly I couldn't even watch the movie character in the book oh Oh, in the book yeah dude i mean it is the the movie watching him in the movie it's visceral and it's the hair it's all of it it's just the complete total lack of of any sort of sympathy or empathy or feeling and he's just a stone cold creepy killer um one Mm -hmm. of the best films of all time no country for old men certainly yeah that's that's not one I'm going to be able to watch with Bo until he's at least nine. So I'm going to have a few more years of that. But, uh, yeah, thank you for uh, letting me get that out. I It was bubbling up inside me. Pam sucks. Don't be a Pam and don't marry a Pam. That's my PSA. <laughs> Which means it was a very well-written yes. and performed movie. 100%. That you can stick with you like that. All right, let's uh, take our first break. We'll come back. We'll uh, hand out the menus for the show today. The streak will end, uh, assuming everything well, goes to plan. Maybe. 
because we do have a guest scheduled for today's show. First well, time in uh, a week and a half. Like Winston Wolf said in Pulp Fiction, let's not go blanking <laughs> each other's blanks just yet. <laughs> we'll see. Anything can happen. Right, we'll come I've back. never wanted a guest to not answer their phone <laughs> more. He's going to lose his mind. If, if, he, if he bails, that's going to lose I think it's a good one, though. I'm mind. looking forward it's, to this I'm, one. I'm so looking forward to it, but I'm not going to believe it. Until we get him on the phone, and we'll tell you why next. All right, that's coming up after a check of traffic. Getting started with Ben and Woods on a Wednesday on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
Good conversation on movie villains going on in our YouTube chat. That's fun. Uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us on the stream this morning, listening on the Odyssey app here on 97.3 The Fan, and anyone who's listening later in the day, uh, podcasted, however you consume Ben and Woods, we always appreciate you joining us. Uh, every single day we have the best radio audience. Good evening to those of you yes. listening at 6 o'clock at night. <laughs> Good and afternoon. The, really the best audience I, I mean, in the history of San Diego radio audiences, at least. It's pretty incredible. There's no there's no doubt in my mind. Mm-hmm. Tier ones, it's it's not just the size, which is Whoa. It's the girth. impressive. It's the, <laughs> it's, it's, the length. Length. <laughs> it's the length of them. It's their girth. It is uh, it's the motion of their the ocean. motion of their ocean. <laughs> yeah, they're growers. They're not showers. I love them. They're just the best audience. <laughs> they're they're clever. They're smart. They contribute. They do. They are great Padres fans. They're funny, you know. They're they're everything you've always wanted Generous. an audience to be. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, and we have it, and it's uh, it delights me to no end. It does. It's a uh, it's such a trip, man. Such a trip every uh, every day to log in and see the chat filled, and I'm like, what are you maniacs doing? Like, what did you guys do? You're here for four hours. You're loons. I love it. Got another so, very good call yesterday from the boss. Yeah. about how things have been going. Call so, nice call you, from thank you all from Kluger. Uh, yesterday, the very handsome Adam Klug uh, called us uh, as well. Very, very nice day. Very All right, happy. coming up uh, on the program today, uh, we just got uh, a new list of Padres top prospects. Kylie McDaniel yeah. of ESPN just came out with his top 100. It's list season. prospects. It's it is Kylie's still list season. Season. It's Kylie's turn. It's list, list season, season never man. ends. Uh, similar to other lists with a couple of uh, different twists, but as you can imagine, the Padres uh, fare quite well. In the uh, the ranking of prospects is probably the best thing they've done this off season is prospect rankings. Well, that and and I really, really, I let myself get excited about the uh, the write up he had about Leodales de Vries and um, one of his favorite favorite targets in there. And of course, of course, of course, of course, Ethan Thaleth, uh bodes you know looks very well in, uh, in that spinal. List as well. Yeah, spinal. Ethan Thaleth looks good right now. In uh, other baseball news, a major sale going down involving the Baltimore Orioles could change things a bit in the AL East. I know Orioles fans, they're excited simply because anything different than what they have now is yeah. probably good news. So we yeah. can uh, talk about that. Seven o'clock hour, we'll bring you Take on Woods, Don't Do This, or uh, our normal segments. Polly is just now copying and pasting. Is it time to hit the panic button yet <laughs> on segments? Because I made, after the show, I made fun. Why is every segment just. Have the the phrase? Is it time to hit the panic button? Yet, Padres it. fans. I in love it. it. So I'm just much. asking the questions. I'm just asking the questions here. Is it time to hit the panic button? The answer is no. It's not. And uh, I am looking forward to our first guest, really on the in phone the month. since before fantasy camp, <laughs> ending the streak of seven straight shows with no guests at all. And about a week and a half since we've actually had someone call in because we had a bunch of people join us yeah. in person in fantasy camp. Poway High School, MLB, former player and now analyst, Xavier Scruggs is going to join us at 9 o'clock this morning. Great, great content provider for baseball. It's a it's a fun niche that uh, the base, you know, there's so many, there's, it's actually daunting how much good baseball content there is out there. I told you last week about the, what's the one, uh, baseball isn't real, uh, those guys are crushing it. Uh, Xavier's doing a really, really good job as well. Kind of burst on the scene in the last few months, putting out really good stuff. He played over in Korea and dominated over in Korea, Benny. Um, he did he did one that was really cool with his wife uh, who gave birth over in Korea. They kind of walked you through what that was like. Wow. Really, really fascinating stuff, man. Um, seems to be a very, very good dude. Now, the only thing I will say is that Pauly got the... Yeah, I should be able to make oh. nine o'clock work. So, like Winston Wolf, I think he said, uh, "I can probably do nine a.m." I can probably do nine a.m. I see. So let's not so go. This isn't set in stone. This is more <laughs> set in slate, written down in pencil with an eraser standing by. So it, it could go horribly wrong. And, and, and this is uh, not a prank on and you. And he's by the one. The way. He sat down with Ollie Marmol. Yeah. And, and did so a, you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah. Uh, we played some of that. Uh, conversation when we were talking about analytics in baseball yesterday yeah, he's good man interesting conversation there with the manager of the st louis cardinals so i guess i will cross my fingers <laughs> yes for xavier scruggs uh, coming up at nine o'clock this morning now if he bails are you gonna have a meltdown 
No. Okay. Are you going to beat me? I thought <laughs> in my mind's eye, I pictured Ben <laughs> saying, well, we have to. We got to clean up the process, Paul. Did you email him? Did you confirm? Have you texted with him? There's a process involved I, here. No, I've done Polly's job before, and I know how hard it can be to sometimes pin down guests. Do you think it's a phone call? Is it really that hard? Yes, it's very hard. Sometimes it can be very difficult to pin people down to a time. Well, and it's a little counterintuitive because we want to have things locked down at least a day in advance. Of course. Sometimes several days in advance, if, especially if there's like a PR person involved helping coordinate. But we like to promote and tease and let you know the day before, hey, make sure you set an appointment. You're going to join us at 9 a.m. Like we did with Tom DeLong from Blink-182. How'd that go? That bit us in the ass. Yep. But it's so much easier to get these guests if... I just text them like, hey, what are you doing in five minutes from now? Yes. That doesn't help us doesn't as far help as planning. Us. Yeah. But then they can just go, I'm actually free right now. Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds great. A lot Jump of people on. are like, I don't know what I'm doing for dinner tonight. I know. Let alone, what am I doing at 7.35 a.m. on Friday morning? Yep. I don't know. I know. And being a morning show, you do deal with a couple of different factors. Uh, in sports, there's a lot of people who stay up really late for work, so they don't get up in the morning, and they'll just say... No, I can't do it before 9 a.m. I just, you know, I, I don't get up. I don't get up. Enough <laughs> there are. <laughs> there's there's the there's number one, of one <laughs> culprit of all time. There's one of them. Yeah. You know, well, you can get up at 4 a.m. to fish, but you can't join us. See, huh? I always see him fishing in the afternoon. Maybe that's, why he, do see, that's so why he doesn't catch yep. anything. If you get your ass well, out of bed. I had a nice bed, picture of a fish the other day. Yeah. You know what that fish was? A, a bird dropped it in his yard. Oh. Yes. He goes, since I can't catch my own, a bird dropped this in my yard. He held it up. One of the most brilliant posts I've ever seen. Of course, of course, talking about the great Don Orsillo. The guy's laying in bed in a food coma from the, you know, veal chops he made the night before and can't get up and call his favorite radio show. Makes me insane. The uh, sports celebrities are real people too, though, and they often have families yep. and have to deal with, you know, kids and breakfasts and taking people to school, oh, we which that always lot. impacts our request for a show. Can we go into just 7.30? No. Now I've got to get the kids in the car, yeah. get them I'd to school. I'd say 40% of yeah. our guests at some point are like, hey, uh, I can do this time or this time, not the time that you asked, Correct. because I, I'm I got drop off. Yeah, drop off some, drop off some bitch, man, and pick up some bitch, too, dude. I was there yesterday. It's a nightmare. <laughs> it is a bitch. So fingers crossed for Xavier Scruggs. Everything works out perfectly. The stars all align apparently, and he joins us at nine o'clock this morning. Uh, Rinal report in our final hour, but coming up next. Oh boy! Obviously, a little oh, disappointment for uh, San Diego State Aztecs fans last night. I wanted them to get that win at Colorado State. They came out. Awful, awful at the start. Awful. And uh, they recovered, but just not for long enough. We will talk about the uh, loss. Brian Dutcher's very uncharacteristic display of temper last night in the huddle as well. Uh, we've got some more details this morning on what went into the Dutcher meltdown Love it. in Fort Collins last night. We will talk about that coming up next with Ben and Woods. Don't go away. San Diego's number one sports station. 97.3 The Fan.
Did you know you can listen to 97.3 The Fan with your smart speaker? Ask your device to play 97.3 The Fan to give it a shot. Brian Dutcher has always struck me. I mean, he's a fantastic basketball coach. He has proven that over the last several years, culminating in the trip to the Final Four in the National Championship game last year. But the basketball coaches I knew, and Paul, you played, you played hoops growing up, they were all really mean, and they all yelled a lot, and it just was like constantly. The only nice coach I had was not good. Was not a good coach. Yes, <laughs> you know what they Too are. Nice. You know what they they are. They're they're demonstrative. They're demonstrative on the sidelines. They yep. they stalk the sidelines. They let the refs have it. I mean, at every level. And and I've seen Dutch, you know, say things to refs when he doesn't think he's getting the calls. He's not asleep at the wheel, but. You know, first Coach Fisher and then Coach Dutcher, they've had success without being the tyrannical, you know, military, Bobby Bobby Knight Knight type basketball coach. And I always wondered, is he too nice? Is 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 Dutch just too nice of a guy we to also, be a top basketball coach? We also have no idea what he's like in practice. Well, and and now I wonder if they he's been hiding a little bit because last night in the game at Colorado State, we saw the different side of Dutch that I, I hadn't really seen before, at least in a huddle, with his own players. We'll get to that right after a check of traffic here on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Traffic is sponsored by San Diego Mojo. Get a little busier on the roads, guys. A crash on Northbound 805 before Market Street appears to be blocking the two left lanes. Several vehicles involved and Northbound 5 before Mile of Cars Way. Collision involving a car and a motorcycle. That's got the two left lanes blocked. Get ready because the San Diego Mojo Pro Women's Indoor Volleyball Team is taking professional sports to a whole new level. Don't miss the nonstop excitement of indoor volleyball starting this February at the Ajas Arena. Visit San Diego Mojo VB.com today and Kelly Danica Fenimwood, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Now, the Aztecs came out last night's game. They were well rested, hadn't played in a week. Uh, they were taking on a Colorado State team that had lost twice last week. Mm. And you're thinking, okay, this is a game that is ripe for the taking. So when they came out and fell behind 13 to 2, uh, in the first four minutes, and they, it was a sloppy, <laughs> sloppy thirteen to two turnovers. <sighs> I, it, it looked like they hadn't played basketball in months. I, I don't know if that's rustiness. What was the cause of that? But it's going to get under any coach's skin when his team opens a game like that. And and Dutch even said after the game, you know, starters just didn't come out the way we were expecting them to, and and the bench got it going, and then we turned it around after that. But they did not. Start the game the way I would expect our team to play. And then they actually made a little bit of a run. They cut the lead to three in the first half. And then once again, they fell apart and the lead was extended back to double digits. Dutch had to take another timeout. He had to use most of his timeouts in the first half, which you never see. A college basketball coach likes to save most of his timeouts for the last, you know, five, six minutes of the game, give his players rests in the second half. He had to use multiple timeouts. They burned one, getting one in bounds in the first half. It was awful. And on that timeout, when they had just allowed another run, Dutch first went out to the referees and gave them an earful because he felt like, you know, Colorado State had gotten a couple of calls that his team wasn't getting. So he just wanted to make sure he was heard. But then he went back to the uh, the huddle. And we didn't see this on the live TV telecast, but they showed it as soon as they came back from the break. Dutcher, he gets handed the clipboard from his assistant coach and just absolutely slams it down onto the court. And then you can see him, like, screaming. And he's, he's, just, he's gesticulating and with his arms, and he is, he is really letting his players have it. And I have not seen that from Brian Dutcher before, that kind of <laughs> anger at his own team in a huddle. I, I don't know, his entire uh... six years as head coach of the Aztecs. <laughs> he, gave it, he gave it the old... I'm going to throw my right arm in front of my face. I'm so mad. The old, I am really Really mad mad gesture. Yeah, it was... uh, Two-handed slam of the clipboard. Now, was it... um, Somebody said on your tweet, calculated. And I I thought to myself for a moment, um, maybe, maybe, yeah. You know, there's a time and place to fire your guys up. Um, Again, I think it carries more weight. Now, I know that they didn't win the game, but I think it's... 
Bro, when you have the silent per like Ben, if Ben all of a sudden got really mad oh, and God. I mean, I'd be like, Ugh. if I did it, you'd be like, oh, this is just what what he does. If Ben was like, I'm mad, I'd be like, holy crap, dude, because it carries more weight. So as your Scruggs doesn't call in and Ben just yeah, starts just, breaking things. Oh. As it turns out, there was a bit of theatrics. Sing it. To Dutch's actions. So he was quoted in the in the UT after the game. First, I didn't take an early timeout. You know, and you, if you were watching the game, you heard uh, Pete Gillen kept going. Hey, Dutch is going to call a timeout. He <laughs> said it. He's got that bo- that thick Boston. You got to call a timeout. Call a timeout here, and he's not calling it. I know they've got the Bucky, media timeout. Ricky, Danny, Terry, Timmy, Dummy, Davey. But there wasn't any foul calls. There was no stoppages. Right. It just the the clock kept ticking. And he says, "I didn't take an early timeout because I'd already given them the game plan." When we finally took a timeout and we're down, I told them, why am I going to take a timeout to tell you what I've already told you? You know what it is. This is exactly what I told you was going to happen, and it happened. So he was already upset with his team. And then when he's screaming at them, here's what he said about it after the game. As mad as I act, I'm just trying to get a response out of my team. I'm trying to let them know that how they're playing is unacceptable. The throwing the clipboard is to get a response. It's one more than just yelling. So I slammed the clipboard and let them know I'm not happy. And he said, and and they responded. And they did. The Aztecs rallied from as many as 14 down. They rallied three times, really. They got it to three, and then they fell back. They got it to three, and then they fell back. And then finally, midway through the second half, they got all the way back and took a 61-60 lead. Their first lead of any sort (laughs) in the game. Lamont Butler made a couple of baskets, a nice run. They took a lead. Colorado State took a timeout at that point. And, Pauly, I, I texted you at that moment. Yeah. And I'll, I'll read the text that I sent because I was, I was excited for how they were playing, but I was also worried by what, what I saw. And I, I knew you guys might have put a little money on SDSU because you were getting points in the yep. game last night. And I said, my advice, which usually sucks, I understand. <laughs> Fair. Hedge here with Colorado State. The Aztecs expended a lot of energy at altitude to get the lead. <laughs> if you can get a good price right now, I kind of like the Rams. And I felt like, and I can't specifically tell you what game it was, but watching enough Aztecs Mountain West altitude games, I know I've seen that game at least two or three times where the Aztecs fall behind early because they go on a shooting slump and then they fight back because they always do. The Aztecs never just roll over and die in any game, especially a conference game. But they have to work so hard at, you know, 6,000 feet or whatever Fort Collins is, getting back into it, outworking their opponent every second just to take that lead, then they have nothing left for the last, you know, five, six minutes of the game. And they didn't. It was turnovers. It was sloppy. Sloppy. Colorado State had one last, you know, one last gear that they were able to turn on, and they, they blew the doors off San Diego State the last few minutes of the game and went on to the 79-71 win. So Dutch's meltdown kind of worked, but when you need to go to that early in the game, you've kind of already lost the battle. Well, and there was, a like you said, the, the next gear, Benny, they were in, they were redlined. Once they, once they came back and, and took that one-point lead, you're right. I mean, it was like, Defla- it was weird because they came all the way back. They had great defensive play. Miles Bird is so fun to watch. He uh, electric he's so that run. fun to watch, man. Mm-hmm. That dude, that dude's gonna be really, really good. Hit the um, three and then came back down and for the block that shot. Yeah, from and just ah, like fired he was up. fired up, man. I love the emotion he plays with. But you're right. Once they hit that, it was like, all right, we don't have another gear at this point. That was like, it was like we got to the top of our mountain right now. And then Colorado State would just go on these runs, six nothing, eight nothing. A um, lot of sloppy, a lot of sloppy turnovers yeah. last night. The 15 turnovers is a lot for San Diego State. I mean, they're, they had two against Wyoming in their previous game, and a lot of it was centered around their big guys, uh, Ladie and Saunders. Not not the best game for either of those two, Ladie. Did turn it on a little bit in the second half, but he was double and triple teamed, had a lot of turnovers underneath. They contributed half of the turnovers, just those two guys, some bad passes from Saunders, who who had one of his worst games, 18 minutes, two points, four turnovers, only three rebounds and one assist. Just not a good game uh, for the young forward who's been – Dutch is stuck with him in the starting lineup because he doesn't like to make changes, but – at some point, he might need to think about a rotational switch here because Saunders has struggled a little bit as the season has gone on. I'm not saying he won't 
be a good player at some point, but he's definitely kind of gone through some some tough times here for the Aztecs. Well, it, it, one of the things, uh, one of the, the pervasive thoughts I saw on, on Twitter last night was why not continue to get the ball in Reese Waters' hands when he is absolutely white hot? Um, they just didn't, it, and... and he was shooting the ball well. Seven and nine. Yeah. You know, it's 17 points. It I, 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 was he one of the guys who had been sick? I I'm know, not sure. I know I, the D had food poisoning over the weekend, and a couple of other guys uh, mispracticed because they were sick. And Dutch didn't make any excuses on that, but that can't be the best thing when you're going to altitude. You know how bad you feel when you travel and you're not feeling well. I don't know if that had anything to do with the rotation minutes of that game. But, yeah, they're, they're certainly – there was some criticism in terms of, you know, why did you go away from the things that were working? Well, and and the inability, I think, to get Jaden the ball underneath. I mean, what's the guy's name? The Boston guy, Pete? Pete Gillen. Pete Gillen. <laughs> I, the whole th- you got to get him the ball. You just get him the ball underneath. That right there, you got to get him the ball. And, and by the way, I mean, I've seen muggings. You know that were less violent than what I saw Jaden going just through. No, down you're not. Low. You're not getting the calls on the road in the mountains. No, West. we've talked about this. I mean, just it's, mu- he getting was just him. getting crushed down there. Three guys on him, and it's like, all right, well, somebody's got to be open at this point. Usually, it was Reese like Waters. Happened he didn't get way the too many times this season. Hundred percent. Like every time they're on the road, he is just getting abused. <laughs> and I get it. He's bigger than you, and he's better than you. And sometimes you feel like that's all you can do. Doesn't matter if he also didn't get any calls. It doesn't at matter all. if it's Steph Curry guarding Shaquille O'Neal. Like a foul is a foul. A foul is a foul. He does not get any call. He he gets the fewest calls of any player I've ever seen of his size and stature I mean, and he, ability. He's drawn more fouls than just about anyone in college basketball because he's deserved them. But at some point, it seems like the referees in the last the few last games have just gotten tired it. of yeah. calling the calls. Like. Eh. We've seen this before. Let's let's stop blowing our whistle now. So, yep. you know, that's going to be a key to the Aztecs. You're going to need some of those calls going forward. So they lose. It's the third loss in five games to the Aztecs, who are now 5-3 and three in conference play. Two games behind Utah State, who is coming to oh. Viejas Arena. And, uh, you know, I, I said, quote-unquote, must win. It's going to be very hard to win the Mountain West regular season now. Yep. Which is why I said that. And but it doesn't matter if you win the Mountain West regular season title. It'd be nice, but we're all focused on the NCAA tournament. I saw some panic though from Aztecs fans going, Oh, this team might be, you know, not even make the tournament. I they saw might that last be on the year, bubble. Though. I go, Hold on, hold on. They were they were a five seed yesterday in Lunardi's bracketology. They lost a quad one road game to a, a good Colorado State team that was ranked as high as thirteenth in the country a few weeks ago. It's not a bad loss. You're not gonna you're not gonna get dinged too much for that. You might go down to a six seed or a seven seed, but they're nowhere near the bubble, the 11 12 seed line. Well, so still... but I think the panic was coming from also what lies ahead. Yeah, there's more tough games, yeah, really, but they're really also tough games. they're also games that don't hurt you that much. Yeah. You have to continue to hold serve at home, which they've done. You know, if they lose again on That's Saturday, if, once they lose a home game, then I'll start to worry a okay. little bit. You know, if they can't win a road game, they're not going to win the conference, but they're not going to lose out of the NCAA tournament. If they start losing home games, then you've got an issue. No one's winning road games in the Mountain West. I think. You know, you had Utah State stole one at Boise State. That's why they leave the conference. But ultimately. Everybody is losing on the road this year because it's just a really tough conference and especially a tough conference to travel. So I did, I sent a tweet out, and it, this is not, again, a prediction. There's almost no chance the Aztecs have a magical run two years in a row because, you know, Duke doesn't make the Final Four two years in a row usually. But last year at this time, through 21 games against a much easier schedule, they were 17 and four. This year they're 16 and five against a tougher schedule. We had some concerns at this point. If you'll remember, there were some concerns about the Aztecs at this point last season as well. This is not the final product. Dutch's teams and Fisher's teams always seem to get better as the season goes on. I'd say be patient, give them a chance to continue to improve and get better. And, you know, if they don't, well, then it'll end up being a disappointing well, year. But I, I have no reason to think that. This is the final Aztecs product, and this is as good as we can hope for the rest of the season. We listed off all of the reasons yesterday. If you follow college basketball even just a little bit, this isn't breaking news. There's no point in playing your best basketball now. Right. You, you, we said it yesterday. You could literally go 0-30. Yep. Get hot for four days 
in your conference tournament, win it, and you're in, which is a huge indictment on college basketball. That's a <laughs> totally different conversation. I think uh, regular season champions <clears throat> should be the automatic berths more than the tournament. Then why would you even play the tournament then? Right. <laughs> Maybe make them both automatic berths. Right. I don't know. You get a second team can get in. Maybe if they expand but the NCAA put tournament, put some emphasis on the regular season. But until that happens, the season comes down to four days in your conference tournament, and then you can win six games in a row, and you're the national champion. National champion. There is no point in playing your best basketball now. This this the regular season is the preseason. Yeah. For a short. Postseason. It's the same in the NBA, honestly. I mean, it, it's so, bit, yeah, so, many, it is. so many people I mean, make, make it. Over the, the Lakers, t- uh, eight, eight last year, they yeah. had the play in tournament. Yeah. They made it to the conference finals because yeah. they played well at the end of the season. Well, and, and, you know, to bring it back to baseball for just a second, this is what, remember when we talked to Trevor Hoffman at Fantasy Camp? This is what he wants for baseball, too. I mean, you want to devalue, like, I love the current playoff format. I think it's fantastic. I don't think there's a damn thing wrong with it. I think the number of teams is right. You start adding more teams. I mean, there is already a, a, a many a pervasive thought that it that it's too long anyway. Boy, you put sixteen teams in there or whatever. That regular season's going to be. I, I mean, last year the Arizona Diamondbacks won eighty four games, two more than the incredibly the disappointing, disappointing San, San Diego, Diego Padres, Padres yeah. and they ended up in the World Series. Yeah, so we're already kind of there. We're kind of there, man. It doesn't take a great regular season to win a World Series in it, baseball anymore. And doesn't and, take a great reg- UConn last year. They're pretty terrible in the regular were season they? for UConn. Oh yeah, holy cow! I didn't know that. Remember, they did not have a, the Aztecs were a better seed than they were in the tournament. They uh, yeah, they were wearing the right. home weren't they wearing the home uniforms in the I last think game? That's was, a what was their or regular? Was a four, or it was a four seed maybe against a five seed. It I mean, was not. Rob says diluted in the chat. Yeah, maybe, but like I don't want to start snipping teams from the playoffs because the playoffs are the best in in every sport. They're the best in every sport, and I get it. I get it, but I can see why you say that. All right, we'll come back. Um, I want to get to some baseball. We had uh, a new Padres prospect rankings list come out from ESPN this morning. That and take on Woods next year on 97.3 The Fan.
Main story right now on the ESPN.com uh, website. Big headline is Kylie McDaniel's list of uh, top 100 prospects in the game. And once again, the San Diego Padres are, are rising up the charts it's in the prospect. Sprinkled with Padres. It is sprinkled with uh, six Padres on the list. And uh, it, it bends a little younger than some of the other lists. You do, of course, have a, a Jackson Merrill on there, but... Uh, Ethan Salas is uh, the highest Padres prospect uh, in Kylie McDaniel's rankings as he has uh, risen up in many of them. He's number nine uh, out of the 100 in all of baseball. That's pretty good. At 17 years old. But, he, oh, yeah. Uh, Salas. Yeah, Ethan yeah. Salas. Yeah, but uh, you also have their very newest prospect as part of the top 100 as uh, Leo DeVries has made the top 100 as well. Uh, you've got in pitching, uh, Dylan Lesko checked in at number 88. He is also one of the younger. He's just 20 years old. So three of the Padres' youngest prospects are among the six that uh, that made it on Kylie McDaniel's list this morning. That is interesting. Uh, Ethan Salas, at least, and there was a couple others, I think. Um, Colt Keith for the Tigers that we just talked about the yeah. other day, who signed got that the big, extension. big contract extension for the Tigers. He's number 40 on Kylie McDaniel's list. And when you look at Ethan Salas at number nine, let's extend them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. DeVries was all the way up to 73. Uh, the others uh, are, I mentioned Jackson Merrill, Robbie Snelling, and Drew Thorpe, the new pitcher the Padres got from the Yankees, uh, the 23-year-old. He checked in at number 64 on the list. Do you have the write-ups there? I do have the write-ups. Will you read, because I saw one, I couldn't find it. I was digging for it, um, the DeVries Right up. Yeah. Number 73 on the list, uh, Leodales de Vries, 17 years old, switch hitter, throws right. The best player in last month's international signing group, uh, plus tools across the board and more feel than you'd expect. De Vries has been widely seen as the best player in this international class for a few years. The track record of that sort of prospect is very good, though not perfect. He's 6'2", 185 pounds, switch hitting shortstop with four plus tools and more of an average or so projection for his defense at shortstop. Sometimes with prospects who have spent this much time at the top of their class, scouts find it difficult to evaluate their soft skills, raw power translating in the game, pitch selections against pro stuff, in-game defensive actions, etc., because these players are often training for workouts. Finding pitchers of similar quality and age to hit against is also essentially impossible, so they're beating up on low- to mid-80s pitchers with little command in their age group or facing fringy pro pitchers who are in their early 20s. Last uh, paragraph, early returns from San Diego suggest that DeVries' in-game power and pitch selection against pro-level stuff are even better That's great. than the franchise expected. And this is the organization that Ethan Salas just shot through to double-A right after he turned 17 years old. DeVries' upside is among the most exciting on this list. 280 with a strong walk rate, 25 homers, and real speed on the bases while playing shortstop. This is about as aggressive as I've ever been with an international teenager who hasn't played a pro game yet as putting Jason Dominguez 40th on the 2021 list is the only time I put a prospect that high. Pretty great. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty great ride up now. We'll see what happens. There's absolutely no crystal ball that, that says any uh, any of that will come true. Some of it, a little bit. Um, but, you know, certainly good things to, uh, to to think about as you move forward. Yeah, a lot of, lot of, lot of talent, Benny. Uh, you know, we'll look forward to that in 2028. 2029 uh, potentially, but that's kind of let's be honest. If you're you know you're in it for the long haul, Padres fans, and I know you are, that's kind of when you're going to need him, right? <laughs> like when when Xander Bogarts is your DH, Manny Machado is your first baseman. Um, that's when you're going to need that that young stud shortstop uh, to come through, and and you'll have your your young stud catcher. Um, you, you read write ups like that, and you go, all right, hold on to these guys, let's see them progress, and uh, see how they do. While uh, this list is mostly good news if you're a Padres fan, there's one part of it that, that concerns me just a little bit, and I will get to that. I do want to throw out our phone number, though, for Take on Woods. Uh, we're about three or four minutes away, but the lines are empty right now. So if you want to get in, try to play our musical trivia game against Woods, qualify for a trip to Las Vegas, and concert tickets, call now at 833-288-0973, 833-288-0973. Get online. Paulie will put you on hold, and we'll play our game in a couple of minutes. So as I said, it's a very young list. Other than Merrill, who's at number 12, and and Snelling maybe later in the year, maybe Thorpe as well as a double air, but you're also looking for help this year. Oh, and yeah. the guys like Marcy and Paulie and 
Martorella, who might be a little closer. He doesn't have those guys in his top 100, and you wonder whether there's any help coming immediately for the San Diego Padres for a team that right now has areas of need that they're hoping to, you know, maybe get some contributions from younger players. Those younger players, they're not ready yet. And the ones that are getting closer are not their best prospects for the most part. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a very astute point. Um, and again, I, all I can go is is based on what I, I heard from the guys that, that train and work with those guys every day out in Peoria. And, you know, like I said before, the three that you mentioned, is, is the word that they said, they're dudes. They're absolute dudes. These guys are going to, um, not saying they're going to crack the opening day roster, Benny, but uh, I think reinforcements will be there uh, mid-season, maybe even early, you know, if not mid-season, then early next season. You're going to have you're going to have some of your problems solved, which is why I think Padres, I think, and I think, I think Padres fans get that. I do. I think everybody understands that. Okay, great. Like, these guys are coming. The Cavalry's coming. What are you going to do in the meantime? Because you still have some really great players and, you know, a, a, a rabid fan base that wants to see some dubs on the field. What are you going to do to fill the holes that you have right now? That's That's been the, the biggest bugaboo is everyone's waiting. Like, we'll take Eddie Rosario at this point. We'll take Eddie. We would have taken Aaron Hicks. We'll take anybody uh, at this point. What are you going to do about 2024? Because that, that season is knocking on the door right now. Of uh, Jackson Merrill, who he ranks 12th, says elite bat-to-ball ability, above-average power, a shot to stick at shortstop, but he needs to clean up his approach a bit, and he calls him perfect guy, perfect. The Padres are a perfect team to maybe give him a shot in the big leagues over the summer. He could ultimately fill any position except catcher and center field. So Good. maybe corner outfield is an option still for Jackson Merrill, even though there really hasn't been any reporting on, on a lot of work that he's done out there. If there's one, you know... Could have been regret. The name right above him still on that list at number 11 is James Wood. James Wood. Right fielder, Washington Nationals. You know, traded away for Juan Soto, who ultimately, you know, the Padres were not able to keep around, did not get more than the one playoff run out of. And he's a guy that when you're looking for an outfielder, if he was still in your system, he'd be ticketed right now as one of the Padres' starting outfielders for 2024 if he was still in the Padres' system. It's going to stink uh, watching him drop 35 bombs for the Nationals yeah. this year, but uh, such is life, my friends. You, sw- you win some, you lose some. That one that one could potentially hurt. And I, I promise you that when those trade negotiations were going on, I bet A.J. Preller did anything he could to try to keep Wood out of it, and the Nationals were pretty much, it doesn't happen unless Wood is in the trade. And ultimately, made that decision. You know, you can regret it now. You can appreciate the the Soto that we saw for a year and a half, but I don't think Soto ever comes if Wood ever goes. So you can't regret it too much. And you know, I wish I wish A.J. had held out for a better deal and somehow kept Wood. I don't think that was ever a possibility. But it would be nice to have him right now. It would wouldn't be it? nice. Wouldn't it be nice? It, w- it, it would. would be nice <laughs> to have the 21-year-old James Wood as one of your answers in the outfield at the moment. Yeah, he's uh, he's projected to do some big things there in Washington. So I know they're very excited to have him. And, hey, listen, I'm excited to watch what the kid can do. Hopefully not against us. Yep. So. And they went through their pain of, of losing Soto and struggling to – to get guys like that, no, they to lost be excited every, they about lost, right now. They lost everybody. I mean, they lost every everybody. Bryce Harper, Trey Turner, uh, Juan Soto. I mean, they've been through it as well. It, it doesn't give me any peace knowing that they also struggled because they did hoist a flag, and we have yet to do that here. So Strasburg uh, retired. Yeah, Strasburg retired. Yeah, I mean, it is. They, they've been through it certainly, um, but they do have their their flag that flies forever, and uh, we are are yet to get that one. All right, uh, let's see. We got a contest on the line. Let's get to it. It is time to play Take on Woods. Let's go out to, uh, uh, is this James? Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. All right, James, you are a contestant today for Take on Woods. It is brought to you by Valvoline Instant Oil Change. It only takes 15 minutes, and you don't have to get out of your car. Sounds like you might be in your car right now. For directions and discounts, go to SoCalOilChange.com. That's SoCalOilChange.com. What you're playing for as we uh, wrap up January We'll be one of the final people to qualify for our getaway to Vegas. Two nights at the Westgate, Las Vegas Resort, and Casino. Tickets to Tom Kiefer and L.A. Guns 
at the International Theater on April 1st, 2024. Tickets available now at Ticketmaster.com. James, here are the categories to uh, choose from today. Got the mystery category. Got make believe. Those are five different song titles that include the word make. And we've got oh to be young. Five answers, song titles, and artists that include the word young. So the mystery category, make believe or oh to be young. James, what would you like to play? Uh, I'm going to try uh, make believe. Make believe. All right. So today's category again features five different song titles that include the word make. You'll have 60 seconds to answer as many as you can. Pass if you don't know an answer. I will come back to it if there's time left on the clock. We'll start with our two-second song. Polly will play you a clip of music. You need to give me the title and the artist to score that point, and we'll go on from there. After you go, Woodsy comes in. If you beat or tie him, we'll put you into the drawing for Vegas. James, I know you know how it works. You ready to play? All right, ready. All right, Paul, you ready? All right. Category is make believe. 60 seconds on the clock. Your time begins when Paul plays the music. <clears throat> Good luck, James. Let's take on Woods. Everybody dance now. Fleetwood Max Christine McVie told her husband John that which song from the Rumors album was about their dog and not her affair with the band's lighting director? Uh, Ed Sheeran recorded which song for the TV show Sons of Anarchy? It's also a description of what I did at the Arizona Strip Club. Uh, Daryl Hall said the only way he can play the unusual sounding piano riff at the start of which Hall & Oates song is with a specific and rare type of Yamaha keyboard. Make my Correct. I don't even want to guess how many babies were made to which Grammy-winning Boys to Men hit that was the lead single to the band's second album in 1994. Pass. Go back to our two-second song. Oh, oh, it's a one. Just you make my dreams come true for James. Mm. Hang on, James. Uh, the other answers. That was going to make you sweat by CNC Music Factory. You make loving fun by Fleetwood Mac. Was not about the dog. It was about an affair. Make it rain, of course, is what I did at the strip club and the Ed Sheeran song. And I'll make love to you by Boys to Men. Rounds out our list of make songs. Now, this is a tough category. I don't know if one's going to hold up, but we'll see how Woods does. Doesn't get the category. 60 seconds back on the clock. Your time begins when Paul plays the music. Good luck, Woods. Let's take on James. I'll come back to it. Fleetwood Max Christine McVie told her husband John that which song from the Rumors album was about their dog and not her affair with the band's lighting director? Pass. Ed Sheeran recorded which oh, song God. for the TV show Sons Pass. of Anarchy? It's also a description Pass. of what I did at the Arizona Strip Club. Lap dance? Incorrect. <laughs> oh. Daryl Hall says the only way he can play the unusual sounding piano riff at the start of which Hall & Oates hit is with a specific and rare type of Yamaha keyboard. What is this category? Pass. I don't even want to guess how many babies were made to which Grammy winning Boys to Men hit that was the lead single to the band's I'll second album. you. Correct. Back to our two second song. It's CC Music Factory. Uh, dun, dun, dun. All right, pass. Crap. Fleetwood Max Christine McVie told her husband John that which song from the Rumors album was about their dog and not her affair with the band's lighting director. What did she sing on there? Um, <laughs> the Chain. Daryl Hall said the only way he can play the unusual. Oh, my God. No, that was a 1-1 one, one tie. Oh, no way. Holy cow. James, you better call back in. He hung up because I think he thought he was going to lose, but he actually did qualify. All right. What is the category? The category is make believe. So every song included the word make in the CNC title. CNC Music Factory is going to make you sweat. Make you, I would have never gotten that. You, I was going to say, I thought it was Everybody Dance Now, my whole life. <laughs> it's That's in parentheses, but the song is actually called Going to Make You Sweat. Fleetwood Mac's song is You Make Loving Fun. You Make Loving it's Fun. It's not about the it's dog. It's about her dog? It, no, it's about the lighting director. It's her affair oh, with the lighting about. director. She told her husband, John, who's in the band, this is about our dog. <laughs> but it was, it was really about her affair with the lighting director. I watched a documentary about rumors once. <laughs> oh, my God. So what did I do at the strip club that involves the word make? Make it. 
make it make rain. Make it rain. <laughs> uh, you make my dreams come true is the one that has you the make weird. make my dreams dun, come okay. dun, 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 Terrible dun, showing. Dun, dun. And you got all make love to you, but yeah, tough, that tough category today. <sighs> And a one-one tie. There's James calling back My in. Lord, he gave up. I don't know. Do you get to qualify? Yeah, you give, up? give it to him. Yeah, we'll give it to him, James. James. You there? You're back in. One was good hey, enough hey, today. Hey. Good. That's a tie. You never know. You never That's know ridiculous. on Taking Woods. That's ridiculous. That was, that was so hard. Hang on the line for me, James. Tough category today on Take on Woods. All right, uh, James, hang on the line. Paul, I'll get your information during the break. Don't drop off again. Uh, we've got uh, Don't Do This coming oh, up man. next. The uh, You guys see the latest scandal out of the NHL. And it yes. is a huge one. And uh, update on a horrible Don't Do This story from earlier in the week. Terrible. Involving that Jackie Robinson statue. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Uh, we'll get to that coming up next after a check of traffic. It's Ben Woods on 97.3 The Fan.
The 2024 Pro Bowl games are this Sunday. You can hear them right here on 97.3 The Fan and the Odyssey app starting at noon, live from Orlando. Our second Don't Do This story. <laughs> Sorry. Get it, the Pro Bowl games. Oh, don't, uh-huh. don't do this. I was like, what? What? <laughs> ah. All right, uh-huh. uh, update from uh, the story we brought you earlier this week. <laughs> and I... um. I made the point <laughs> that this was low for even criminals. Oh, man. The like under the jail type stuff. You yeah. know what I mean? The stealing of a Jackie Ro- Robinson bronze statue uh, in Kansas. Uh, was it Wichita? Wichita? Wichita, Kansas, out of a park where they actually sawed off, like with a metal saw, at the ankles, the Jackie Robinson statue. It's and, unbelievable. And it was missing. Well, they have found the statue, but the story is actually getting worse. They found it burned in a trash can, and it is uh, unsalvageable. So it wasn't stolen uh, to melt down to sell. It wasn't stolen for someone's, like, private collection right. or anything like a that. A footless it was, Jackie Robinson statue. It was statue. simply a horrific case of vandalism and it is just you know such a bad thing for that community Uh, obviously they're going to do everything they can to try to replace the statue it was about a fifty thousand dollar statue that they had commissioned in mcadams park in wichita it was installed in 2021 Uh, that's where their like youth baseball leagues are like 600 kids playing their their youth leagues there at the fields at where that statue was put up and uh yeah it was found later two people were seen on surveillance video Ooh. hauling the sculpture away in the dark to a truck that was later found abandoned so what this was world, this was man. like was it what were their motivations was it we don't were, know who race, it is racially they, motivated what uh, was it i mean police are promising there will be arrests but uh we're gonna make sure we have a solid case they say it's only a matter of time so it sounds like they have some leads God. and hopefully they uh yeah, they throw the book at whoever well, they catch for this. Uh, our friend Kathy uh, just DM me and said they have the mold of the original. They do, so they can do it. They're also doing a GoFundMe. I don't think I'm gonna. I don't think they're gonna have any problem reaching the the number. That's a good point. To get the publicity that back of the story. Up. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. I mean, I'm happy to donate if I see the GoFundMe. I think that is a, an atrocity. And uh, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad that, that it's moving in the right direction. Just to, it was jarring to see, like when you saw the the feet cut off, as we mentioned. Another really jarring story for uh, NHL fans out there, man. This is a this is a really really uh, tough one. Four NHL players were charged with sexual assault in London, Ontario, on Tuesday. Uh, all they all have different attorneys. All the legal teams did confirm to ESPN. Philadelphia Flyers goaltender Carter Hart. Calgary Flames forward Dylan Doobie, New Jersey Devils center Michael McLeod, and defenseman Cal Foote. They were all members, Benny, of Canada's 2018 World Junior Championships team. They were at an event to get their gold medals, and uh, they have been charged with one, or they've been charged with sexual assault of a woman that one of them met uh, down in the bar area. She consented to uh, sex, and next thing she knows, all these guys started showing up in the room, um, and the the details of it obviously are not, don't really want to repeat on the radio. Um, they are all pleading not guilty. They have all been released from their teams for now. Uh, the one it, there was one interesting uh, part the the Philadelphia Flyers general manager last week it came out that Doobie was granted a request for a leave of absence on January twenty first. Uh, they said he was tending to his mental health. And then they're saying, oh, we weren't aware of these reports. Uh, This thing's been under investigation for like two years. So now people are calling them, uh, it's actually the Calgary Flyers. They're they're saying, Flames, Flames, I'm sorry, the Philadelphia Flyers. They're saying, oh, we we didn't know that he was uh, one of the guys mentioned. We let him go for mental health reasons. People are saying, bro, everybody knew about this. Everybody knew that these guys were uh, potentially going to be charged, and uh, they were. So we will see how this shakes out in... In the court of law, man, but it is uh, a real, real dark spot for the NHL. This yeah, season. Uh, obviously the the legal system in Canada, and I, I'm not sure exactly how the the differences between ours and theirs will play out. It's sad though that it's been more than five years since this incident, and it's taken that Has long. Has it been five? You yeah, said 2018. Yeah, that's right, 2018. So it's now it's early 2024, so more than five years to finally. Kind of make this case and for the facts to, to come out. Yeah. So 
Uh, it does show you, even in another country, that things move slowly sometimes. Nuts. And it's, uh, I'm sure, a tough situation. All right, a little do-do this for a Wednesday. D-D mega do-do. Do. Want now? I made fun of the Pro Bowl games, the All-Star weekends. It can be a bit rough. I do... I do think the three-point shooting contest is usually pretty entertaining. NBA yeah, All-Star Weekend is coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, February 17th and 18th in Indianapolis. If you remember last year at the WNBA All-Star Game, Sabrina Inescu of the New York Liberty made a lot of news when she broke the three-point shooting record that Steph Curry had set with 31 points. She made 25 of 27 shots doing the whole thing around the arc and whatever you get 60 seconds for a total of 37 points the best ever performance in a three-point shooting contest so you know the talk was so who is the best who is really the best three-point shooter on the planet is it steph curry the nba's all-time leader or is it sabrina Inescu, who holds the wnba single season record and the the three-point shooting record well they're going to settle it in exhibition fashion with a three-point shooting challenge at All-Star Weekend, Curry versus Inescu. And he'll obviously be shooting from the NBA three-point line with NBA basketballs. She'll be shooting from the WNBA line with WNBA basketballs. And they can go head-to-head, -head and we can determine with a little pressure on both of them who comes out as the top three-point shooter on the planet. Which is fun. That's going to be promoted. I wonder who Ben will be rooting for. Hmm. I like Curry. Just... Any Curry. I like Just, Steph Curry. I like Steph Curry. <laughs> I think I'm going to be cheering for Sabrina. Yeah, I think it's, I think it'd be awesome. Be I think a lot of people are going to be cheering for Sabrina on that one. Chances I know one participant in the dunk contest. Zero. Zero. Have they announced who's I don't think I've heard the uh, or seen the list for the dunk I contest. I wish LeBron would do it. He won't, it. Be, he won't do it. Yeah, I know. I just wish he would. Is it still the Rising Stars dunk contest? They have a Rising Stars game, um, which... That was the worst thing that the NBA did Wemby is with the dunk play contest. In. Wemby is, but they, so did they make yeah. that for a long time? It got moved to is the Rising Stars dunk contest. Like you had to be within your first like two or three years. By the way, uh, in the chat, Matador Jr. said she uh, Sabrina said she tweeted she's going to shoot from the NBA line. Ooh, oh really? That. Is that right? I oh, like originally that. Originally, it was she was yeah. going to shoot from the WNBA oh, line. Oh, I like that. With the WNBA balls, and now she's going to step it back. I love that. I like it. No one can ever. No one can go. Oh well, she she got a little bit closer. Now yeah. she'll say, "Hey, no, fair no, and square, I love fair that. and square." I do too. She beats him. She beats him. Um, you know, it's weird. They, I know, like the home run derby. There's at least the thought that some guys mess up their swing and. Yeah. It's exhausting to go and do that competition. Did anyone ever really get hurt in a, I mean, in the history, I'm sure someone has gotten hurt slam, you know, dunking a ball, but in the NBA slam dunk contest, I don't remember any injuries. I don't remember anyone. I messed up my entire game <laughs> because I jumped and dunked three times during an all-star weekend. I jump so much, I can't shoot threes anymore. Right. Why, why can't the stars participate in a dunk contest Man, anymore? I hate to be the when we were growing up, but when we were growing up, Dominique Wilkins and <laughs> Michael Jordan and I mean and then in I had Vince Carter Vince Carter was ungodly the in goat. the dunk contest <laughs> un ungodly in the dunk contest There's been some good ones I just saw randomly on Instagram the other day I was like never forget this dunk contest I think it was 20 17 or whatever is Aaron Gordon and Zach Levine just yep. going at it, trading 50 dunks after 50s. I mean, unbelievable. It, it, but I think, the, is it about the great dunks? Those, those are cool, and you'll watch them for a second. It really would be more about the stars sure. though, if they were doing yeah. it. I will list you. We could do a real or fake on dunk contest winners. Last year's winner, Mac McClung of the 76ers. He was a G-leaguer. That's right. Yes. Little Let's guy. See. Yeah. Other yeah, he was the little guy from the G League. Um that was Anthony awesome. Simons, Derek Jones Jr., Hamadou Diallo. Uh, Donovan Mitchell did win in twenty eighteen, went on to be a star. Glenn Robinson, Zach Levine won back to back, John Wall, Terrence Ross, Jeremy Evans. I mean wasn't great. Now do the eighties. Yeah, the 80s. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then, Dominique, Spud Webb. Spud oh, Webb was, was the best. He's three Michael feet Michael Jordan, back-to-back. -back. Dominique, D. Brown. Uh, D. Cedric Brown. Cedric club said. Harold Miner uh, won Hardly a couple of times. Him. Isaiah Ryder won. Hardly Brent Berry won. That was a, a 
a notable one in 1996. Kobe won in 1997. So, yeah, the names were a little bit bigger back when they, they first were. started. God, that was fun when I was a kid. I'll, that, I'll still watch that, though. That's, that's pretty uh, fun. Don't and Do Do This for a Wednesday. That was Don't Do This with Ben and Woods on 97.3 The, the Fan. The thing with the dunk contest now is they've been doing it for however many years. It's all about now it's just the creativity. It's so hard to be creative with a dunk. Like I you mean, have to think of something that has never been done. There was... I, Maybe it was Zach Levine a few like several years ago. He lit a cupcake, the that's candle right. of a cupcake, put it on the back of the rim, and got so high he could dunk it and blow out the blow thing. Out the, like that's what you got to come up with nowadays. Yeah, shoot me out of a cannon. <laughs> There's only so many things you can do while throwing a basketball through a hoop ten feet in the air. Jordan from the line, like remember how iconic that was. But when now, we were kids. now everyone can do that. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Instead of a fifty point. Dunk. That's like a thirty. Oh yeah, like, like, mm. cool. Everybody here can do that. Give away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give up. All right. There's one uh, major league baseball fan base that's a little extra excited. A little this juice. This a little morning. juice. This morning. We'll explain why. Coming up next with Ben Woods on San Diego's number one sports station, ninety-seven three. The fan.
Polly just brought up an interesting thought that uh, if Bronny James does go to the NBA in the next year or two, could he and LeBron James compete in a slam dunk contest together? Obviously, LeBron has talked about wanting to play with his son yep. at some point in the NBA, and we were just talking about, obviously, how incredible that really would be and, and the circumstances that would go into it. The fact that the Griffies did it together, that they so batted awesome. in the same order together. I was, I'm was i looking up, and I'm trying to find, were there any other... Other than like a one-off when the you know the father was like in the fifties, I think it happened. You know, fifty years old, it happened. But like, like active, game yeah, almost <laughs> active players, father sons who were actually in the pros at the same time. And I, I found the Griffies. The fact that LeBron and Bronny can even like think about doing it is pretty amazing because. You know, we were kind of going through the logistics of it. So you have to. Like it feels like baseball. I mean, obviously, like golf, you could I could see that happening, but. Baseball is really one of the only, at least of the major like four sports, where you can play into your late because Griffey Senior was playing into his forties yeah. when Ken Griffey Junior was making his debut, and he was a very young player. You also have to be a stud as yeah. a young player, yeah, yeah, to get called up that so, early. So you have to be able to play. You have extreme longevity in your sport. Obviously, you had to have a child that was born when you were fairly young yourself, just to have that age difference. Twenty years old, small enough that this is even possible. And then that child has to be as elite, you know, as you, or at least elite enough to get to the top level of their sport <laughs> in a, a reasonably quick amount of time. And the Griffies are really the only example. But yeah, in basketball, when you know careers usually end more in their mid thirties. It's not something you really would have ever thought of, but LeBron has just defied age so much to be at this high level in his late 30s, approaching 40, and to have Bronny get so close, it would be something that maybe could be never matched in sports But I if mean, they did it together. Is, is it a foregone conclusion that Bronny James is no. going to the NBA? I, I'm I looking so. at his numbers right now, and they're massively, massively pedestrian, but I know he's a young player, and... Probably. He'd have to almost certainly be a one and done, maybe two years in college, yeah. depending on how much more LeBron has in the tank. I mean, this but year he's still, is he's this year is reco- he's level. recovering from a heart attack. Fair, <laughs> coming back. You would this think year. a team would have to use a second round draft pick on him strictly just for the for, for the, yeah. knowing that we're going to get LeBron and, for a year. And I would think that there's got to be a lot of thought that you'd want to stay another year and develop in college after having this year interrupted yeah. so much by the health issues. Unless like the Lakers took him at number. four. 58 or something. Yeah, I, I don't know, but it would be a pretty incredible story if it happens. All right, uh, as I said, there's one fan base in baseball pretty excited this morning about something that's happening with their team. I want to get to that after a check of traffic here on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Davick. Crash that cleared on northbound 805 before Market Street and northbound side of the 5 and accident cleared before Mild Cars. Wait, just watch out for a little residual slowing on both those. Westbound 54 just past Rayo Drive, an accident involving several vehicles. I looks like that's some debris across lanes all due to that. Fire crews responding to a possible brush fire westbound King Freeway at Massachusetts over the right shoulder. In the North County, southbound 5 coastline just before Cannon, there is a collision involving several vehicles. It's over to the right shoulder and eastbound 78 approaching the 15. Watch out for an accident blocking the slow lane. I'm Kelly Danik with Ben and Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. All right, uh, Tier 1 just called in. Uh, well, who was it? John, John just called just in. Called in. Uh, Gordy Howe, who had an incredibly long NHL career, um, 26 seasons in the National Hockey League. Good played, God. Played <laughs> with his son. I think Mark and Marty, he played with both of them in the NHL. 26 years yeah, in the NHL. Crazy. Yeah, one season, 1979 through 1980 on the Hartford Whalers, my beloved Whalers. Uh, yeah, and he looked... He looked every bit of 45 years old at the time. I rem- We've talked about this before. I remember. People, people 50 years ago just looked older. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Wilford Brimley uh, in the firm was like 36 years old, I think. So, <laughs> in Cocoon, he was like our age. Yeah, yeah. He was, <laughs> he was in late 20s in Cocoon. Speaking of that, uh, just on an aside, it, it, yesterday I was – walking through the studio at Channel 10 because I needed a pair of tweezers. I had a a rogue gray hair that was sticking finally, out of my head. Finally. I've had like five or six over the years, and I just pluck <laughs> them out. And But I didn't have any tweezers, so I went into the area where everyone's kind of cubicles, 
Uh, and I said, one of you must have tweezers. And everyone's looking around. And they go, what do you need them for? And I go, it's nothing really that gross. I just need to pluck one gray hair off of my head. And I found out that every everyone at Channel 10 thought I used Just for Men. They go, what? <laughs> Everybody gray, asks me hair? all the time. They all assume that I'm a Just for Men guy. Well, and I... I I've Lindsay t- Pena, our anchor, goes, you don't... You don't use just for men. I just I'm assumed. pretty sure at fantasy camp, Mark Loretta leaned. We were yeah. sitting behind you, and Lo leans over to me and goes, "Does he dye his hair?" Goes, and, no. I, and the thing is, people have asked me before, and I and they go, "Do you really think that he does?" Like, just be honest. I go, "No." And, and number one, why do you care? But number two, <laughs> right? no, like he doesn't. He doesn't dye his hair at all. And I go, he would tell me he's not a super vain person. I'm way more vain than you, and I don't dye my hair. I do use though. Did you know this? There's a, a product. <laughs> this is how I skirt the issue. So there's just for men where you can take, like I did my mustache when we were out at spring training last yeah, year with so Peter. Yeah, so you look like Peter Seidler. Yeah, so yeah. I, I did it brown so that there wasn't the white uh, in it. But I have this stuff that you use. You put it on in the shower in the morning. In the shower. So you wet your, your beard. Rogaine. No. You wet your beard. <laughs> you rub it in. You leave it for two minutes. And it's from just for men. And it gradually gradually darkens some, but I still have a ton of white hairs you in do. there. It's very, but very it, gradual. It works. It, it's very gradual. But I won't I won't do well, the, I, and the comb I think, and I mean, the stuff. selling point there is that if you can do it slowly, slowly enough, that no one no will one notice. Because when you, when you Boy, show up one day... And it's just, b- like, black. And you look like... Um, you know, silver fox, yeah. and then the next day your hair is completely brown. You're not fooling anybody, but if you can do it slowly yeah. enough, people will like forget. Oh, he didn't he have gray hair before? Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, no, I'm gonna I, the top. I don't mind. I don't. I'll let it go a little bit gray, but the beard I like to try to keep a little bit darker. So uh, to baseball and uh, Baltimore Orioles fans. Now, I mean they're optimistic, obviously, but uh, with the news yesterday that John Angelos is going to be selling the team. And he'll make a nice profit on it. It's a $1.725 billion sale price for a team he bought for uh, somewhere between 100 and $200 million. My dollars. God. Uh, and I know that they had some issues in terms of like inheritance and what was going to happen. So he just decided, let's just sell it. And they are going to sell it to a couple of guys who made money uh, like like Peter Seidler did, you know, and... Um, Venture capital type type guys, private equity, firm. private equity yep. uh, type guys who are going to take over the team and Orioles fans who are used to not you know competing for top free agents and playing on the cheap are hoping that this could signal a new era in Orioles baseball coming up in which they're a little more financially competitive. Which, considering the Orioles have been very successful in recent years with their minor league development system and had a great year last year throw some cash into that mix and you could have a pretty dangerous combination in Baltimore. Yeah, I mean they're they're loaded with prospects. So the farm system is still just burgeoning there in Baltimore, Ben. Uh guys are getting ready to, you know, pop. They're they're getting ready to make their debuts, the Jackson Holidays of the world. Now you've already seen the Gunnar Hendersons, the Adley Rushmans, those guys have come up and made an impact at the big league level. And now after a really kind of slow off season where everyone thought um, you know they're going to go out and spend some money. They really, they really haven't done a ton. They got Craig Kimbrell uh, at the back end of their their bullpen. But no, the, the thing is, is I, I don't know anything about the guys that bought it. I do know Cal Ripken Jr. Uh, was is, is a part of one of those groups as well. He has they, a small yeah. share. Well, they're smart to put a uh, friendly 100%. and uh, beloved face as part of their ownership group. Kind of like uh, no brainer. Kind of like San Diego FC did with Manny Machado. Yeah, very, very You're, smart. You know, make uh, a make get a, a public face to your group. It's the Carlisle Group. David Rubenstein or Steen is the uh, is the big money guy behind it. Now it says uh, a typical sale, as you can imagine, a lot of layers takes several months. So this shouldn't likely impact any like immediate free agents like oh now the Orioles can go out and sign yeah. Cody know, Bellinger Cody Bellinger right. I don't know that it's going to work quite that way but maybe by next season they will have a different financial structure in place and certainly they can think more about you know extensions for some of the younger players that they've got that's, stars like Adley Rutschman that's the key that right there's keep have to be guys. traded away and um you know they've got such such great prospects on the wage with Jackson Holiday of course Gunnar Henderson so you know keeping those guys around adding some parts 
could make the Orioles a factor for many, many years to come in the American League East. Now, we don't know. Maybe these guys are not you know, interested in putting tons of money into the team, but you'd think that they're probably better off with these guys than they were under the Angelos family. Bro, and you remember what the, the GM did. Remember last year we talked about that that – uh, when they when they suspended popular broadcaster Kevin Brown for pointing out that they had struggled in Tampa Bay, uh, then John Angelos went and told the New York Times the team was reviewing their internal process for discipline. They were talking about raising prices dramatically. He said, um, "He said I'll come on up. I'll show you my books sometime." To that reporter, he obviously never did that. Um, they've just been, they have just been. Terrible, terrible owners with, with again, a city that's rabid for baseball, a uh, long tradition of winning in Baltimore. You know, I get it. They're competing in the AL East. But now, man, if you're a Yankee fan, if you're a Red Sox fan, Rays fans, everyone spends more than you. Uh, if you're a Blue Jays fan, you're like, oh, boy, there's another suitor at the table with potentially some really deep pockets. But I think you make a good point. It's They've done such a good job at drafting and developing. Such a good job. You cannot let Adley Rushman in a couple of years split town and and you know go play for the Dodgers or the Padres or anybody else. You want to keep that core that you have because you've really done a great job with it. Little other American League news from yesterday: World Series MVP Corey Seager of the Texas Rangers is expected to miss most of spring training after he had surgery yesterday to repair a sports hernia, which um, not a doctor, but that's not the hernia that. Like guys like us get what this is, is a hernia? different kind. Of- I, it's like insurance. I've heard of it. <laughs> I don't know how it works. Hernia is when, like, part of your internal organs it, it, push through, like, the muscle, like, to go on the outside. So, like, if you lift, a, yeah, I thought it, it was something in it your creates back. Like is a separation it not, is it in the front. You can have a herniated disc. Herniated That's disc. That's different. Oh, a hernia. Is more of a an abdominal type. What's issue. a sports hernia? So a sports hernia is actually <laughs> it's just just a hernia when someone who plays sports. Okay, yeah, right. It's that that's actually now a tear in the groin. Oh, it's the official. I, think I have a. It's sports not a hernia. real hernia, but because of the tear, I guess it can it can cause you know a a bulging in the groinal area, not the kind that you're thinking of, Woods. The actually true condition's name is athletic pubalgia. Which sounds Save that. <laughs> athletic pubalgia is what Corey Seager has, and he had it repaired. That's but good. it's going to require some recovery time. It's going to cause him to miss spring training. He's a really good player. If he, you know, they're really going to miss him if he doesn't come back one hundred percent. He's really, really good. I actually have a a small hernia as well. You do, yeah. Where? It's a hiatal. It's the belly. I had a belly. hiatal yeah. hernia when I had my gallbladder right. surgery. I feel it's like not, it's not an uncomfortable or dangerous. The doctors say you don't really need to do anything about it unless it's like causing you discomfort, which it doesn't. But it's not that appealing looking. Oh, let me see it. Really? Yeah. We're on t- camera Show right it now. To me. You want to? Yeah, want to see, see my it. hiatal hernia? No, I, more, more than, than anything, it causes my belly button to to bulge outward a little more. I don't. I can't even tell. Oh, it's in your belly button. See, yeah, because I have an any, but it causes my. That's Belly it? Buttons. Yeah, it's not well, much. That's not that bad. You're very creamy under there, by the way. <laughs> not sitting out tanning in my Speedo very often, <laughs> as we've already discussed this week. I've got a pain in my groin, and I think it might be a sports hernia, because there is a little bit of a like a bump. It could be. Yeah. It's, uh, it's from on baseball, my groin, not my... It's, it's caused by a lot of twisting and turning. It's any tear of a soft tissue, oh. muscle, tendon, ligament in the groin. Do I have to have surgery Is on this sports, thing? You might need oh, a sports hernia surgery. Tier Can we broadcast season. that live? Sure. On Tier the YouTube season in doubt. Yeah, I'm down to Woods do it. Woods' sports hernia surgery. We'll you know, schedule I'm, that. I'm always doing my massager on it and stuff. It's just not getting any better. Not helping you. No. It's great. Getting old. Me and Corey Seager. Mm-hmm. Valuable pieces. Now I've got the the mental image of you using your massager on your groin. Uh, like I grind into it. I lay <laughs> on Carlos a asks us in the chat, did uh, Delilah give you that hernia? No. No, I've had that for a while. <sighs> no, don't blame Delilah. Because you did do that one move where you picked her up by the hips and did, like, you spun her around like an ice skater. <laughs> so maybe that's what caused it. I was like, is this you never know. dancing? <laughs> You never know. Yeah. I had the time of my life. 
<laughs> nobody, back, nobody should Photoshop back that Back with more Ben and Woods next year on The Fan. <laughs>
Oh, halfway home on a Wednesday, the last day of January. Finally, it's coming to an end. The, uh, now, of course, the rains will start tomorrow. The skies will open up. Uh, allegedly, it's going to be pretty bad. You're listening to Ben and Woods 97.3, the fan. Great to be here with you. I'm Woodsy. That's Paul Rindle. He is the executive producer. Benjamin Higgins is your friendly, very friendly, creamy sports anchor. I don't tan either. I'm white as a ghost. Well, I tan. I just don't let that part of my body see the sun. Very well, often. you don't tan actively. You're, oh you're, no, I like it creamy. Yeah. Your skin tans very nicely. You, you look like you're Greek when you're out in the sun. I mean, he gets a nice color, but you don't actively rip your shirt off, go into the backyard, and lay lay out. All right, we've got a. I do not. I do not ever just lay out. What's well, really not that good not for healthy, you yeah. to just lay out in the sun. I use but sunscreen I lo- I when lo- I go out and play golf. I love to have some color because my. But le- you do need some vitamin D from the sun. Oh see? wow, you are very, very creamy. <laughs> That's like blinding Dude, on this YouTube stream. Why do you think I never wear shorts ever? Couple of medical updates here. Okay, good. Uh, from first of from our, our girthy tier ones. Yeah, they are so girthy. Dan says, I had sports hernia surgery last year. And he says, it's no joke. The doctor says, three months, you sh- cannot lift anything heavier than a gallon of milk. Do not pick up anything. Okay, so maybe I don't have it. You, uh, I mean, you know, Corey Seeger is going to have to recover from that kind of surgery. And then um, I just got a text from uh, Mark Loretta, who's uh, caught the Just for Men discussion. <laughs> Says, as long as we're talking about men's health here, hernias, etc., he wants to know what is Dupatrin's contracture, Woods. Every time that West Coast men's health spot is on, he's yeah. mesmerized by the term. It is a uh, it is a pain in your hands, and your hands actually will start to almost turn into like a claw, like one finger. I learned my dad has it. His is his. his Pinky finger is like bent, and he can't he can't straighten it out. It's, it's just gnarly, like stays man. This way the whole time now. Yeah, I don't. Even I don't when he like plays golf. I said, go well, West Coast men's health. Yeah, just get a little acoustic. They do therapy. surgery, but it doesn't really help. So it must be the uh, the acoustic wave therapy to yeah. straighten out your fingers it can, a little bit. It, it, it can help with that certainly, and also other things. Speaking of girth and whatnot, but uh, <laughs> great, great to be here with you guys this morning. I I love Mark Loretta so much. He's literally one of my favorite humans on the planet, and. Sneakily, one of the funnier dudes you will ever meet in your entire life. Why don't you call in right now, Mark? We got nothing to do. Yeah, eight three three two eight eight. Mark knows my dad. Sees him at the golf course. Yeah. So you can ask him next time about his Dupatrin's contracture. He can even show you what it looks like. Now he still gets around the golf course okay, despite it. So. In fifteen minutes, that dude yeah. will rip eighteen holes on you. Like, and the and by the way, congratulations to. Uh, to fantasy champion manager yeah. Mark Loretta, along with Mark Grant. He's Their the team best, man. Won the title uh, earlier this month in Peoria, Arizona. Just the best. The Just... low ride in mud flaps. That's right. That's right. You got guys lost of, it. Got rid of us. Got rid yeah. of us. Won a championship. It happens. <laughs> it happens. Doesn't sound good when it happens. It's not necessarily because of... Your departure that they won be. the championship, it but people, by subtraction. people in sports I've noticed like to try to connect dots oh. and make it make one equals the the other, even though that's not always the case. Well, it, it, we talk about a lot on this show because again, I, I mean, tomorrow, like Fernando Tatis Jr. Yeah, oh, they had a, he came back this year. And the Padres were worse. Right, uh, must be something that Fernando did Correct. this year. Is he? Is he bad chemistry for the team? Is he is there something a problem that he's causing? Ronald Acuna Jr. doesn't Jr. always it, work like no, that. No, it's in just sports. baseball, man. It's just sports. It, there's a couple of things going on right now in the world of sports that um, I know is part of the canon. I know it's part of the we have to do it. If I have to watch another debate about. Has Brock Purdy silenced the haters? <laughs> Has is Lamar Jackson a terrible quarterback now? It, it, listen, I think athletes like most of us, Ben and, and Paulie, you're judged. You're judged game by game. If you win, great job. If you lose, poor job. You know what I'm saying? Like the Brock Purdy discourse. The Lamar Jackson discourse. The the all the discourse going on up to the Super Bowl is going to make me insane. It's um, 
it's there are a few mysteries in sports that as fans even as you know gms and players that never totally get solved even the championship teams sometimes can't explain what it was that went right because then why can't you duplicate it the next right. year oftentimes you bring back pretty much the same guys and it's not there the magic is not there anymore and it becomes you know, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and and you're just trying to figure out what's going on. Which it, is that? Who I think it is? It is. Ah, it, it is. This guy. It is. This all right, connoisseur of all things uh, contracture out there, and uh, fantasy champion manager <laughs> Mark Loretta is calling in here on ninety-seven three. The fan. Hello. Good morning to you, gentlemen. I use, use the team <laughs> term very loosely. Yes. Good morning. How are you? Where are you heading? Down to the golf course. Uh, I'm playing golf today. Yeah, okay. yeah. I've got uh, our CEO Eric Gruppner, uh Josh Muse, who is involved with I know Josh. Yeah, uh, Josh, great dude, and uh, Servando Carrasco, who is married to um, Alex Morgan. Oh, wow, uh, wow. Um, not that that makes that's what he's all. You know, the other thing he's done. It's fine. No, I'd be happy to be it, known for that. It, that's, it, yeah, uh, you can call no me Mister Morgan, but for all I care. <laughs> The plus one. How's group dog? That's I, it, uh, hold on, what I want to know how. Is he? How's group dog is as uh, with the sticks? Yeah. You know what? He's um, he hasn't had a chance to play much. <clears throat> excuse me, in the last few years, as you would imagine, but played a lot growing up, and uh, he wants to get back into it. I'd say he's probably about a. I'd, I'd go twelve to fifteen handicap. Oh, me and him. So, me v uh, group will be. <laughs> it will change lives. Me against Eric Gruppner for control exactly, of one on one. for control of the team. I think is probably the. <laughs> we'll call it the match. Yeah, let me get that. <laughs> CEO for a day. He's in here schlepping radio, and I'm running the team. I'm all about it, man. We'll tell. Please tell everyone uh, we say hi, man. What uh, what we'll have do. you yeah. what have you been doing now? I know. So for you, special assistant. Um, you know, you're in the organization. What does that translate to? Like, what are your duties over the the, the upcoming months here? Are you going to make it out to spring training? Is, is that required of you? Yeah, I am actually. Yeah, so I'm excited this year. I'm I'm getting back with the player development group. Uh, nice. Riley Westman, Benny Lopez, those guys. You you guys heard Benny out in, out in uh, fantasy camp. He's unbelievable. The the uh, <clears throat> the camp coordinator. So good. And uh, so I'm going to spend most of March with with those guys, with players and staff, and then kind of be a little bit of a of a liaison between kind of the minor league system and and the and the big league coaching staff. You know, particularly Mike Mike Schilt's very involved, has been the last couple of years on the on the player development side, and and I think he wants to keep real real close tabs on that. So I'll I'll be you know kind of briefing him back and forth and, and spending time with those guys. So looking forward to that. That's kind of what he did the last two years. He he'd go back and forth between minor leaguers and big leaguers. And we just saw the announcement of the player development and minor league staffs yesterday with some uh, big leaguers, including Craig Stammen taking on a, a yeah. similar role and AJ Ellis and, and Alan Craig. There's a lot of guys uh, with good big league experience that are going to be helping out uh, Mark with the Padres this year. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the idea is to fill, fill some of the stuff that Mike was doing the last couple of years. And you're right. Those three guys, you know, those, those pretty recent big leaguers are going to, I think spent a lot of time around the big league staff and, and big league players, you know, Craig, of course, well-respected, uh, tremendous, you know, reliever just retired can give a lot of help. I think to that bullpen group. So, uh, it's going to be a good, good mix. I think with the staff, you know, it's funny you're talking to Mark Loretta here on Ben and Woods this morning. Uh, he is a guy, Craig Stammen's name was brought up by probably 10 big leaguers. I've talked to about guys that they absolutely adored adored and and what a great leader he was um you know down in the bullpen and taking on any role the Padres needed him you know uh to to do what about him makes him so special as a leader I think just he's the ultimate teammate guy he's the ultimate team guy he just um you know he cares about everybody he, he's involved with everybody he's not just tunnel vision you know on his own career which which a lot of guys can get into I, I was probably guilty of that you, you get so focused on on what you're doing, it's it's hard to see the big picture. But you know, he's just a, a well-rounded guy. He's got a lot of interest outside of baseball, and and uh, he's uh, he's also very accountable. You know, he, when he's when he's struggling or not doing well, I mean, he's the first to tell you. He doesn't hide behind anything. He's always you know out front with the media, and and guys appreciate that. You know, while we're talking to Mark Loretta, I just called in this morning, and we had the discussion last week. You brought up the name Craig Stammen. That to be a leader. 
do you have to be like one of the better players Dude, as well? And, yes. And no offense to Craig Stammen, who was actually a very solid reliever for many years mm-hmm. in his career, but he was generally kind of the long guy out of the bullpen, not considered like the most essential guy on a team necessarily, but he was in fact a leader. How much it- I mean, we had talked to somebody out at fantasy camp, like our first day who was very much in the know of the clubhouse. And he goes, it was a huge loss. Like losing that voice yeah, a massive. couple years ago, like he was the guy. It, yeah. In, the in your mind, Mark, you know, how, how important was it that the leaders of the team had to be some of the star better good. players <laughs> or did they not? Could it be the 25th guy on the roster who could be the leader sometimes? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, something I've thought about a lot. Uh, I think it certainly helps if if you are you know a star player and, and and you take on that leadership role and guys really really focus and gravitate to you. But I think if you're a really special guy like like a Stamen, what I what I feel is like he's the go-to guy for the rest of the team, right? So even if he's you know not Trevor Hoffman or or not the the closer. Just the way he carries himself, the way he's willing to to do a lot of things, uh, you know, outside of the ordinary, uh, the way he interacts with the players, that that, that that's how he leads. Um, now, I, I, ideally, you know, I was talking to uh, way back. I was talking to Danny Ferry, who was the GM of the you know San Antonio Spurs, and he said, "Look, you know, we've gotten so lucky by having a, a steady group of guys like David Robinson and, and Duncan." And, and these guys who are not only our best player, but also our best worker and our greatest leader. So if you have that combination, that's gold. But it can work the other way. It, yeah, and it's it, it's weird, too, because if there's a guy that's making a ton of dough and he's a really valuable leader, I'm not naming anyone specifically. You could probably read between the lines, Padres fans. But he's making a ton of dough, and he's a good leader, and everybody loves him, and he's beloved in the clubhouse. But the play suffers, but the money doesn't stop coming in, but the play is suffering and he's not performing as well as he could. People still will look to that guy as like, oh, no, he's the best. We got to have him out there. That's that's the weird part right. for me to reconcile, though. Well, and, that, and that's the hardest time to lead, right? When you're not when you're not playing yes. personally well, hundred percent. I mean, and that's and that's I think what what makes you know good leader good leaders great is they're they're able to still you know be that positive influence on other guys when their you know their own performance is struggling because it's hard man when you're when you're struggling you never think you're gonna get hit again or you know you're gonna get anybody out it's uh it's not easy to get outside of yourself and that's what great leaders do you should see ben when he struggles holy cow man it is like a it's <laughs> like a tornado in here he it's rarely like, struggles come on yeah, guy gray hair. he's as solid as solid as a rock my friend. i just bring up since you're well, on hey, your I'm way I'm really glad you you straightened out the Dupachin's contractor yeah, you're because you know, with West Coast Men's Health, I, I just assumed it was a Something male else. problem. Yeah, and I was I was always thinking, man, contracture can't be a good thing. Bad. Uh, yeah. So, but I'm glad it's I'm glad it's just about the hands. Well, that's that's good. Good luck. I Adam. mean, I'm not glad. I'm I'm, I'm sorry for people who suffer from <laughs> yeah, it. Of yeah. course, like your dad. I don't want to make light of it. No, but, no. But uh, it's not it's that college. part. It's not that part of the anatomy that we're talking right. about. <laughs> Uh, we'll have a good round of golf. I don't know if you heard us talking about it earlier this week. Uh, we took Woods out. We went to the farms last Friday. Eight Woods alive. I would rather have <laughs> lit cigarettes put <laughs> out on me than ever play there again. Bring a basket of balls because you I lose them all. 30, uh, and I lost yeah. every single one of them. I lost 10 <laughs> balls in four holes. With the old 30 pack. The old, the old 30, 30 pack. pack. <laughs> It Indeed. was terrible, dude. <laughs> terrible. Well, so, I hope you don't have golf on the calendar for Thursday. It looks like it's going to be a washout. Yeah, yeah no doubt. Look bad. Well, Mark, we'll uh, hopefully you, see you out at spring training. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for calling in. We appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you. Oh, there's Mark Loretta. The GOAT. Checking in just uh, randomly here on a Wednesday morning. Yeah, man. I, it's, I was thinking about that, Benny, and I, I want to ask that question at spring training. You know, it just... It certainly makes sense, and the Spurs comp is a really great one. I mean, you hit the jackpot with those two guys. They make the most money. They also work the hardest, and they're the best leaders. Zero ego. That's yeah, yeah, zero ego. How can I help? How can I help us get better? Holy cow. But when the play starts, I I never thought of it like what Lowe just said. A guy that can still lead even when his performance is in the crapper is, is pretty valuable. And I think you guys know who I'm talking about, you know, but um, it's Eric Hosmer. <laughs> His name rhymes with Schmerich Schmajmer. <laughs> no, I, and, but those players, there would 
they would be mad when he didn't play. And that's the that's the hard part for me to, to wrap my head around sometimes. Uh, Guzinator wants to know, did that call break our interview streak? Yeah. I would say no. No? It wasn't we didn't scheduled? schedule an interview. That's a tier one calling in. Just because he happens to be True. a little more well-known yeah. doesn't make that an interview. That was just a caller. Imp- calling, I love an impromptu call. Calling in to the show this morning. Now, we do have a guest coming up at 9 o'clock, scheduled at least, Xavier Scruggs former big leaguer and now MLB analyst is going to be with us uh, at the top of the hour, fingers crossed, and the official streak uh, coming up later in this hour. But uh, I'm glad we brought up Stammon. I wanted, I have one more point I want to make about Craig Stammon. And we'll do that when we come back after a check of traffic here with Ben and Woods on 97.3 The Fan. Don't go away.
So we were just talking about Craig Stammen and his, his new role with the Padres as a special assistant. Going to split, split some time between the minor leagues and the major leagues. Mark Loretta was just telling us about that. And I did a, I wanted to do a little story on it last night for Channel 10 as well in my 6 o'clock news. So I needed to go back and find some Craig Stammen video. You'd be surprised. There's not a lot. I mean, when you're a long reliever, you don't amass a ton of highlights. Your job is to your job is to keep games from getting out of hand. Four and, home runs. And those solid. aren't and those aren't the kind of games that you generally get good highlights from. So the only highlight that kept coming up, if you search like Craig Stammen highlights, makes sense. Is going to be the time that he gave up four consective home runs. Back to back to back to back. Back to I'll back never to back forget to it. back. I know to I remember the exactly Nationals. where I was. All right. You say you will never forget it. And I remembered it as well. And I go, I can't show this. I'm trying to, this is a positive story about Craig Stammen. You can't just show him getting, hey, home run, snapping his neck. There goes another one. There goes another one. Dude, a guy gets arrested and you show that. Fortunately, uh, Jesse Agler had posted a clip of a great defensive play he made where he reached behind his back and then caught a ball on a comebacker and threw it home. So I had that one. But you say you remember. Do you remember who was up going for the fifth home run who Craig Stammen struck out? Juan to end Soto. The inning? Yes, it was. Very good. He struck out Juan Soto after giving up back-to-back-to-back-to-back to back to back to back home runs. And then he had to face Juan Soto, who was clearly looking to make baseball <laughs> history as the first ever back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back to back to back to back home runs. <laughs> and he struck him out looking. Shocker. <laughs> And there was a shot of Soto walking with a big smile. Oh, of course, as he went, "Oh yeah, you got me. Yeah, you got me there." It's but just... I had forgotten. I had forgotten that part that Juan Soto was the next batter in the order that Craig Stammen struck out. I mean, very, very rarely do you even get to stay that long in an inning. Howie Kendrick, Trey Turner, Adam Eaton, and then Anthony Rendon. <laughs> and then, oh my God, I remember. I mean, I, I was watching. I think. What year was it? It was uh, 2019. I remember. I was was holding... it Stamina who struck him out, though? It was, um, I think uh, Andy Green pulled him at that point. Did he? And someone else struck out Soto. But Soto was the guy who went for the fifth one. I was holding Bo in my arms and, like, walking him around the, the living room because he was fussy. Shocker. And I just was like, oh, man, that was a shot. Good battle with Howie Kendrick. Ooh. All right, you lost the battle. Next one, bomb. You're like, oh, crap. Next one, bomb. You're like. And then the fourth one, I just started yeah. cackling. I think they were down two to one, and then it was three to one, four to one, five to one, six to one. I, I just started cackling. That's all you could do. If I was on the mound, oh, I, I would have started laughing. So I was like, hard. this is unbelievable, Ugh. man. It was great. Yeah, here's the quote from Andy Green after it. Trust Craig. He's earned that trust time and time again. He still has that trust. He deserves that trust. It's baseball. You don't get the opportunity to see seven pitches in advance. You see it in hindsight. Nobody starts running to the bullpen with their eighth inning guy on the mound after one home run. <laughs> Maybe it was a problem that Craig Stanley was great. the eighth inning guy <laughs> at that point. <laughs> He's our guy, said closer Kirby Yates. He's a guy that takes the ball and everybody follows him. He never complains. He never whines. He never backs down from a challenge. He takes the ball every day whether he feels good or not. Didn't work out for him today. He's the best option we have. You want him out there. It sucks. Hard to watch somebody go through something like that, but he'll be fine. And he was. And we're glad he's back in the organization, and uh, Craig Stammen has always been a great guy. Do you think he can laugh about it now? Yeah, I would think so. All right, I'm going to ask him about it. Spring training. I also saw the other video, which was amazing, and I don't know if you remember this one. He got married. He was on his honeymoon, like 2017, and he was filming his wife. They were playing golf, and he took a shot of her teeing off. She made a hole-in-one. No way. Absolutely not seen nuts. That. Just him and her playing golf on their honeymoon, awesome. and she made a hole-in-one. On video while he was like filming it, and they absolutely lost their mind. He dropped the phone; they were screaming. Picked it back up; she was like crying. It was it was pretty cool video actually of Craig Stammen and his uh, his new bride at the time. They call him dad. Yeah, they call him dad. And then I found the video from uh, spring training when they asked all the Padres players, "Who would you want to babysit your kids?" Craig Stammen. Ninety percent of them said Craig Stammen. Craig Stammen. Craig Stammen. Yep. Got to be Craig. That's the only one I trust. To watch the kids. Looking forward to those bits, man. I miss uh, miss bits, number one, and I miss spring training, and I miss the Padres. So it's it's coming. Be patient. All right. Uh, Xavier Scruggs is scheduled to join us at the top of the hour. I'd love to talk a little bit more about uh, the Aztecs and why I am not hitting Paul's panic button. 
It's got the Padres panic button. We've got the Aztecs panic button. They're all there, but we're not going to hit them just yet. Just put the cover back on, and we're not going to hit it yet. We'll get to that coming up. We but better... you never panic, though. That's the thing. So right. no one's going to be surprised that you're not right. panicking. I'm not you the don't only panic. one not panicking. I'll tell you else who's not panicking when we come back on 97.3 The Fan.
San Diego Legion will be hosting a special rugby match between the All Blacks of New Zealand and Fiji in July. And they're running a special pre-sale offer that starts at 12.05 p.m. today and runs until 6 p.m. tomorrow. In fact, I don't think they've even had the big announcement yet. There's supposed to be a, a large announcement later this morning. Did you just... No, I mean, it's in my... It's We're supposed to read it. Oh, it's my. in my liners yeah. list here. So get your special All Blacks <laughs> versus Fiji pre-sale code with the purchase of Legion season tickets at sdlegion.com. That is big rugby news. If yeah, you're a rugby huge. fan, that is about as big of a San Diego rugby story as you're going to get. Uh, and there'll be more details coming up on that later this morning. I read their uh, their book, Legacy, what the All Blacks can teach us. Uh, really, really good. Really, really good in an interesting, interesting way to... Uh, to run a, a business or or whatever, but uh, secrets of sustained success. Interesting. Yeah, really, really good book. Um, you know, it's uh, it's Super Bowl commercial season. It is coming up. We're yeah. less than two weeks away from the big game, and they will start leaking some of the commercials out beforehand. Some will be a surprise when we get to Super Bowl Sunday. I'll admit, I'm still entertained Same. by Super Bowl commercials. I have no problem with them. Uh, you remember it was two years ago. Remember the Larry David crypto <laughs> Super Bowl ad yeah. when he was basically like, nah, eh. it's not, nah, it's not going to be big. And he was wrong about all of his predictions throughout history. And then he predicted, no, nah, crypto is not going to be big. Well, that was for FTX. That was the Sam Bankman Freed, the one that really was actually a fraud. And uh, everybody lost a ton of money on it. So now Larry David is on the... Um, on the defendant's side of a class action lawsuit since he was part of the FTX advertisement. And he, uh, he said yesterday, I wish I was on the plaintiff's side on this case. I lost a ton of money because they paid me in FTX and I lost a ton of money on that deal. And I, I was absolutely right in that ad. Crypto wasn't everything. It was all cracked up to be. Is a curb your enthusiasm. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what it's based on. That it's is... absolutely right. I wonder if they'll, yeah. What if they'll tackle that in the, New season coming up. This something weekend. Like that. Yeah, it starts this weekend. Yeah. Oh, 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 mama. Yeah, buddy. I almost want to wait and just binge it, but I, I know, can't. So I can't. I can't do it. I can't. Shows weekly now. Can't, it's so hard to do. But I. I, I mean, I. I know I'm going to be. Now that dead. show is not one. It's not serial. No, or but, serial stories. But it's, that are what we would normally think of as like, a binge. I watched a lot of shows that are notoriously good. After the fact, I watched like Sons of Anarchy, sure. Breaking Bad, some of my favorite shows. They were there already in like their final season or two when I started, or they were completed when I started. And Netflix ruined everything for me. Like, have... I never want to watch a show like that with cliffhangers and all that weekly. I can't do it's, it. You, you almost have to go back and watch it again during the week. But with, with Curb, it's more that you want more every time you watch it, right. and you need three to four episodes to to feel satiated it's like 24 minutes and you, you're like oh it's done already i'll sometimes just go back and rewatch it i, I think right ultima then. ultimately well yes we like instant gratification and streaming and you want to just go to the next episode and the next one when you're sitting there there is a certain satisfaction of having to wait for the week and the anticipation building toward the next episode of whatever drama you're hooked on and knowing oh i can't wait until Wednesday nights here and I get to watch the next episode of blank that comes on and you kind of miss that nowadays because it's not how we watch TV anymore and I get it it was always terrible like waiting I wish I could watch another one but that was part of the that was actually part of the satisfaction yeah. uh, as well of a good television program well everyone's attention span has gone to crap I mean it really has I, I'm struggling right now with true detective season four I, tweet, I saw your tweet tweeted about it last night I'm just struck. I love the True Detective series for the most part, uh, and I started season four. It's got Jodie Foster in it. It's got John Hawks in it, who I love. And uh, man, the first one, it, it, there's a bit of a supernatural vibe to it, which I really don't enjoy. They usually. all have a little bit of supernatural no. to them, mysticism at least. No, this is the more voodoo, sci New Orleans this, one in this, the first season. This is more like actual sci-fi like sci -fi. potentially. So I'm like, oh boy. But I'm I'm grinding through it. I'm grinding through it. But it's not it's not 
gotten me so far. Then again, I have an attention span of a three-year-old, so uh, I may not be the best test audience for it. Speaking of grinding through it, that is the uh, that's the plan right now for Brian Dutcher's Aztecs. We'll talk a little bit more about that after a check of traffic here on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Traffic is sponsored by Valvoline Instant Drive Through Oil Change, your 15-minute instant drive through oil change. Problems in the North County, crash blocking lanes on South on 15 at Old Highway 395. Also eastbound 78 before Nordahl Road, stalled semi in middle lanes up ahead for the 15 vehicle down the right shoulder embankment. Still clearing crash the coastline south on 5 before Cannon. Everything's over the right shoulder. Westbound 54 just past Rayo Drive, collision over the right shoulder and an accident has cleared on northbound 5 at the eastbound 54 connector. Stop by any of the 30 San Diego Valvoline Instant Drive Through Oil Change Centers. You don't have to get out of your car, and it usually only takes 15 minutes or less. Visit SoCalOilChange.com for discounts. Locations nearest you, Valvoline Oil Change Centers are open seven days a week. I'm Kelly Danik with Ben and Wood, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Aztecs lost last night 79-71 at Colorado State, their third loss in their Past five games, drops them two games back in the Mountain West uh, Conference race to Utah State, who is coming into Viejas Arena on Saturday afternoon. And uh, while I know a lot of Aztecs fans are ready to hit the panic button, Brian Dutcher is is preaching patience, which is interesting because we talked earlier about even Brian Dutcher losing some of his patience and cool in a very unusually demonstrative display during the first half, during a timeout when he slammed his clipboard and screamed at his players, specifically Woods, his starters. He was not happy with the with the effort and energy that they came into the game. But he also kind of dialed it back after the game. Here was a quote from Dutch. The bench came in and played well, and the starters did not play with the edge they needed to to start the game. We're not going to hit the panic button. We have to get better. They know that. They're good kids. We're not excuse makers, but we're not going to win on the road unless we get tougher physically and get tougher mentally and find a way to fight through some of these stretches where we don't play very well. I think the most concerning thing is the start. You had a week off, and you come out like that. I mean, I, I put the game on. And then was told to go take the trash out. I took the trash out. It doesn't take very long. I walked back in. It was 17-3. I'm like, what the hell just happened? What the hell just happened? You're you're fresh. You're ready. You're prepared. Game plan's in place. And the next thing you know, you look up and you're down 14 uh, four minutes into the game. In some way, the Aztecs uh, got a little unlucky because usually when you're watching CBS Sports, the game before goes long. Yes, you don't even right. see the first seven minutes That's of the exactly right. game. And the game before could have gone overtime. I think if, um, I don't know, St. Bonaventure or someone had a three-pointer to send the game to OT and I would go, we're going to miss the entire oh, yeah. first yep. half of the Aztecs game. They got game. Like three good looks for and, that. And, and they got all three. these good looks. And I'm going, we're going to miss the Aztecs <laughs> game because here comes overtime. And they missed every single one of them. And I go, oh. They're actually going to start the Aztecs right game on, on time. time for right a on change, time. and they do, and boom, seven, thirteen to two, seventeen to four. Yeah. They get they get their doors blown off in the first few minutes, and and Dutch said the bench came in and played well. In fact, when the bench was in, all of their bench players had positive plus minus numbers. Plus minus is the the most basic stat you can have in basketball. It's simply a calculation of when you're on the floor, does your team go further ahead or, you know, decrease your deficit or do they go the wrong direction? What's the score of the game when you go in? What's the score of the game when you come out? If you're two ahead when you go in and you're eight ahead when you go out, you just had a plus six for your time on the court. That's plus minus. The starters last night for the Aztecs, they're plus minus at Colorado State. Minus six, minus nine, minus 16, minus 23. And unfortunately for Micah Parrish in his 20 minutes, Minus 32 when he was on the court. Micah didn't have a good game, and he took the brunt of it. But when Every time he was in the game, Colorado State was going on the run. But he was part of the starters, and, and none of them were immune to the fact that they came out slow and sloppy and not with the kind of intensity and edge you need on the road. Uh, the turnovers were – I mean, every time you saw, he's coming, he's going to knock the ball out. Yep. He just kept watching right Colorado there. State guys – You'd think you'd know because you guys are some of the best in the country at doing that to other teams. Does that not happen in practice when the guy sneaks up behind you and pops it out? Aren't you ready for that on the road? They just looked 
a little unready and unprepared for that game. And you can say it's a coaching issue. You could say that's a player issue. You could call it a rust issue because they hadn't played in a week. Whatever the issue was, though, they put themselves in a deep hole, down 14 in the first half. And they yeah, they won the rest of the game from that point on. But you can't you can't dig those kind of deficits on the road and expect to win games like that. Those are those kind of comebacks when you win those are like once a season, maybe once every two seasons. When you put yourself in that position, you're going to lose the game 90% of the time or more. Yeah, what are your thoughts, Benny? You know, you watch the majority of every single game. Is it a coaching issue when the hot hand isn't being fed? Is it a coaching issue with the rotations, the starting lineup? Is there a, a change that you can make or would make to the team to to give them a little spark in the next game? Because the next game is massive. I had some doubts about Brian Dutcher in the first couple of seasons. I, I they've all been they've all been answered yep. and satisfied. It's it, it's not a trust, coaching issue. You're saying trust it's, the process. It's a college basketball issue. Every single year, you're always integrating new and young players without the experience. You cannot replicate the experience for Elijah Saunders of going to 6,000 feet of altitude in a hostile Mountain West environment until he's actually done it. And, yeah, I know Jaden Ledee and a couple of the players have been there before, but you're always going to have some players who it's going to be a little overwhelming, especially on the road in those first few conference games until they kind of get used to the fact that, yeah, this is brutal. There's, everything is against you. The refs are against you. The crowd is against you. The the air is even against you that you're breathing in the Mountain West for the most part. The travel schedules are against you. It's just a really tough conference to play on the road. And only a team like last year's San Diego State team with 50-year seniors who had gone through it several times already can really even be expected to, to have that kind of success like the Aztecs had last year on the road. Breaking, Breaking. San Diego Padres what? news. Benjamin from Ken Rosenthal. Are you ready for that's this? A real, that's a real person. It's a real person. I'm double-checking the account. Yes. Free agent, left-handed reliever, Wandy Peralta, is in agreement with the San Diego Padres on a four-year, $16.5 million contract with three opt-outs. Sources tell me and Dennis Lynn deal is pending a physical. Th- three opt out. Uh, in in one sense, just consider it then a one year deal, essentially. Correct. Uh, I if know he's good. He's gone. Wandy Peralta is a player that a number of teams were interested in. Was one of the better relievers left on the market. In that sense, that's a, that's a good pickup for the San Diego Padres at a fairly just my instant reaction. Good pickup at a fairly affordable price. Mets were way in on him. They wanted him badly. Right. But uh, the Padres end up getting him. And another left-hander in the bullpen. Does he play left field as Can well? he play left but field? what we're all thinking, of course, is another reliever. You've already signed two free agent relievers. Yeah. The only free agents you've signed this offseason. And now you're adding another reliever to the it's mix. Pretty good. It's pretty good. Pretty good pitcher, man. Pretty good pitcher. He's 32 years old, spent the last three seasons with the Yankees, posted an ERA, sub three ERA. Uh, over this time, his cumulative ERA sits at 282. Hard sinker, 95.9 miles an hour. Change up slider, strong whiff rates. Uh, predominantly generates a lot of soft contact on the ground. Great. I mean, uh, he's thrown 54 or more innings the last two seasons. He's got a couple of walk issues. Yeah, Ruben will get that out of him, no problem. Uh, but, yeah, so uh, good deal. Good deal. Uh, interesting pickup and and bolstering a bullpen that we kind of assume. Could this be a sign? Yes. More to come. Well. I thought you were going to say, is the spigot open right now? Uh, the sign that, um, no, I, I would say that, that maybe there's trade talks involving a younger controllable reliever, like a Steven Wilson that has value to other teams right now, because you didn't address any of your actual needs. You're the bullpen. We had the discussion. Like the one thing I felt pretty comfortable about now was the bullpen going into the season. This obviously makes it even better. You can't complain about that, but is it possible that they're going to use some of that bullpen Maybe, Maybe one of the younger players to dangle in a trade offer to address an outfield situation. Mike, 
Mike for, Pet- going Mike, forward. Mike Petriello tweets, four years with three opt-outs is in the running for the funniest contract of all time. <laughs> you're Welcome not paying, to the San Diego You're, you're not paying attention to A.J. Preller's <laughs> contracts if that's funny because they all look like that. That was essentially Nick Martinez, yep. Michael Walker, yep. Seth Lugo. They all had similar type deals. And, uh, and yeah, that's and, and other teams are doing that as well. By the way, A.J., you can laugh at him, but he's kind of on the cutting edge I mean, of on. those deals because other teams are now copying those kind of opt-out deals. Who's copying them? I've seen a few of them on other teams this year. I can't recall any that have, if, are like that. Not necessarily every year opt-outs, but... Much there's much more in the way of opt outs and deals that we've I'm seen gonna, in this last couple of offseasons. I'm going to insist in our next contract that I have an opt out after every <laughs> single year, so that I have to negotiate a higher salary every every show. Sh- every show. <laughs> I'm opting out, so sorry. <laughs> Call me later if you want me here tomorrow. If you don't, then suck it. I don't know what to tell you. Oh, uh, that is interesting. That is interesting. I was uh, sorry to interrupt your Aztecs talk, but I wanted to get no, that no. Time. I'm glad uh, that, that you're paying attention to breaking news. Well, so. somebody in the chat had clued me in. I was I was listening to your uh, Aztecs campfire stories and enjoying them very much. Uh, but somebody in the class in the chat said, "Yeah, we got uh, Wandy Peralta." So. Good pickup. We'll see what happens, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, now that the 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 hand is loose and you're signing some checks right now, you're ready to go out and get some outfielders and address some of the other needs. And um, it does, you know, is Wandy a nickname or is that uh, short for something? No, Wandy Luis Peralta Dominguez, Dominican professional baseball pitcher. Cool. Now with the San Diego Padres, yeah, career nineteen eighteen three point eight eight ERA. It's a good pickup. Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's definitely a good pickup. It was not someone that I was expecting the Padres to be in. On. Not I on saw my radar. Other teams talking about him this just this last week. I kept seeing the name Wandy Peralta uh, pop up without any connection to the San Diego Padres, which is a good reminder. It's a good sign that where there's smoke, sometimes there's fire, but there does not have to be any smoke at all for AJ Preller to make a move. That he makes many moves that are completely out of left field without any buildup whatsoever in terms of rumors and chat on social media and insiders going. That's almost why when the um, Michael Lorenzen news popped up this week, it almost made me think, well, he's not going to be a Padre. Yeah. Because you heard, you heard about it. And so many of AJ moves are like this Wandy Peralta move that you heard nothing about them until the second that they're essentially official, they're signed, and they're a done deal. I mean, I guess I, guess I don't really – does it feel right now, Ben, does it feel like a left-handed back-end guy is a superfluous signing a little bit? Yes. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, <laughs> asked and answered. It's the kind of move you make when – you feel like you've already got a World Series contender, yeah. and you, you feel like to, the Rangers you, make this move. The Braves you, you, you get yeah, him. You're just, like, oh, just, okay. just yeah. to overwhelm the opposition. We're not taking any chances. We want to make sure we're we've got plenty of depth in case we have injuries in our bullpen. And now we've got Wandy Peralta too. Like, I'm not mad at it. I'm at not all. mad at it. I guess, but it, if but it, it doesn't uh, answer any of the questions, I mean, screaming for exactly. last think three about weeks. It. Think about this though, and. We can talk a little bit more about it after the break. I know we have Xavier Scruggs coming on. He probably has faced Wandy Peralta at some point. Um, if what did what did Josh Hader get? Ninety five million dollars. So they've replaced Josh Hader, kind of in a composite production sure. for. A, I mean, they spent some money on their Asian players, but less than half of what Josh Hader is getting. Yeah. And my guess is they're getting three. Solid guys who will amount to more than a Josh Hader over the course of a season. Yeah, like you said, I'm not not mad at the move uh, at all, but I also know that there needs to be more, and it takes a little bit off of that total that you thought that you might have to spend. So we'll see what happens. All right, we'll see if uh, our guest streak ends, if uh, Xavier Scruggs is on the other end of the line. When we come back with the 9 o'clock hour of Ben and Woods, it is next here on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
All right, just sitting here, wondering why the Padres made this move, signing Wandy Peralta to a four-year no, I, deal. I heard him. $16.5 million deal, although essentially it's four one-year deals since there's player opt-outs every, every single season. Now, we've seen the... We've seen what happens when guys play well, like Michael Waka, and can opt out of their deal. Yeah. Seth Lugo can opt out of their deal. There's also the other side of it. You get the player gets hurt, doesn't do well, he opts in and just keeps collecting paychecks for years and years. You know it all too well. And uh, there's the other side of that possibility as well. So there's risks on both ends of opt outs for the team. And usually it's uh, it's always good for the players to get as many opt-outs as possible. Indeed. That's why you want opt-outs in your next deal. Daily opt-out. At least weekly. All right. We have, uh, we've opted out of guests for like the last week and a half, but that streak is officially coming to an end right now because we are joined by MLB analyst, former big league player, uh, maybe the only player out of Poway High School ever to make the big leagues. Do you know any others <laughs> no, at all? No, no. Xavier Scruggs is with us here right now on 97.3 The Fan. I'm, I'm racking my brain, Xavier, no, trying to. to... <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Happy to be on here with you. Thank you so much, man. We have been enjoying your content uh, tremendously. We love uh, what you did with Ali Marmol. Very, very interesting stuff. I know you were in the Cardinals organization. And, uh, you know, Ollie's been a little bit be down with him feeling like if I'm a Cardinals fan, I'm feeling a lot better about the upcoming season. Yeah, I think that was, uh, first of all, I appreciate, you know, the, the, uh, the, you know, appreciation for the, the podcast, but I think that was a lot of why I wanted to sit down with him is because I know Ollie as a person. Um, I've now gotten to know him better as a manager. And I kind of wanted to see, allow people to see that, that personality side of him, but also his mentality as a manager and some of the things that he's gone through and knowing that um, last year was an extremely frustrating season, but his thought process is extremely positive. He's learned a lot during his you know, short time as a manager, but also his time with the Cardinals organization. And it's a fan base that expects nothing but the best. Yep. And he understands that. And I think that's a lot of what I wanted to show and, and a lot of what I wanted to hear from him and, and get to some of the tough topics that, that involve, you know, managing young guys as well as Hall of Famers and, and try to get the intricacies of that. Because a lot of times we don't get that opportunity to sit down with managers and let them be candid in a sense, and the off season is the perfect time to do it. I think our uh, our friend Katie Wu was writing about his story, and you know, obviously, he learned a lot from Mike Schilt, and I, it was telling the the part where when Schilt was let go by the Cardinals, he immediately said to Ollie, "You take this job. You yeah. know, if they they offer it to you, you've got to take this job." I thought that said something about uh, Mike Schilt, and uh, give give us your thoughts on the new manager of the Padres, Xavier. Yeah, I mean, Mike Schild is someone that I've I've got the opportunity to be around a, a lot during my time with the Cardinals, and I feel like I have a great grasp on who he is as a person and who he is as a coach, as a manager, and I think that there's a lot of things that almost have nothing to do with the game itself that allow him to have a lot of success. I think he communicates amazingly with players. I think he has a great sense of empathy for players and understands how tough it is to play the game. I think he builds a clubhouse culture. And, and obviously that's one of those words that we use in, in all types of ways, but there's a clubhouse culture that he builds off of, of off of trust, off of um, understanding people's personalities, um, being able to mesh egos together. He does a great job of that. And when we look at some of the best leaders in, the, in different industries, it's their ability to bring people together no matter their personalities and feel like they have a, an opportunity to succeed. And I feel like he does that extremely well. Um, he's learned from some of the best when it comes to, to, to his experience. And, and I think he got a tough, tough draw with the Cardinals. I'm excited to see what he can do with San Diego because obviously there's a lot of talent there and just signed another big talent piece with Wandy Peralta. Uh, talking to Xavier uh, Scruggs here on Ben and Woods this morning. Make sure 
if you get the opportunity, go check out his uh, podcast show and go. Really, it, it's produced really well. Visually, it looks spectacular, and you're getting really good guests. Like, well, one of uh, – I'm 48 years old. It's the batting stance I imitated more than anyone in the world. That's Gary Sheffield, who 1,000% should be in the Hall of Fame. He did a long form uh, with you, which is not something he does a lot. What was that like sitting down talking to Gary Sheffield, and what kind of insights did he give you? Man, that was uh, that was special for me. And obviously, you know, I think at any age, we were all kind of imitating that batting stance, at least for some point in our lives. Yes. Um, just because it's, it's unique, but also like the, the player he was, was extremely special. Like you don't see a Gary Sheffield come around that often as, as far as that type of player who had that type of power, but with that type of plate discipline. Um, so it was a great opportunity for me to sit down, especially right before the hall of fame announcement to figure out a lot of what those emotions are like it, having been on the uh, on the ballot for nine years and then the final year this year. Um, and you're right. He doesn't sit down and do long sit downs and, and, and longer conversations. So I felt like it was an opportunity for me to use our relationship to dig a little bit and to figure out kind of how, how he feels about it, but also understand his approach at the plate. Like that was one thing that I was always interested in is, what was the approach at the plate? What allowed you to start doing the bat waggle? What gave you the power that you had? And he's very apt to, to be an open with, with uh, helping young players. So I wanted to figure out what is he telling young players today that can, they can apply to their game that they can, that they can use and, and make them special today. Uh, one specifically jazz Chisholm, who he's worked with. Uh, but yeah, just, I mean, uh, uh, amazing stuff. If, if people get that opportunity and it's, you can't just apply it to baseball. It can be applied to so many aspects of life, a lot of the little um, details that he had about his path and his journey. You know, I got to watch uh, Gary Sheffield up close when I was uh, younger as a Padres fan when he was with the team in 1992 and part of 1993. He's the one player that you didn't want to sit in the stands down the third base line yeah. in foul territory. This was before they extended the nets. <laughs> Take Ter- off. Terrifying oh, yeah. because he was always <laughs> hitting those line drives out in front of him. Just like, okay, straighten that one out. That's a home run. Straighten the one, that one out. That's a home run. And, you know, Xavier, you played at the top level, but there are certain guys, and I, I never totally understood this, that just have, like, skills even above and beyond. And, and Sheffield, that bat speed, that those quick hands, seemed like they were beyond even what a normal professional athlete would bring to the table. Oh, my goodness. It, 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 I mean, you just saying that, it, it almost brings, like, chills to me thinking about the types of players that I played with that are like that. But just even thinking about having the opportunity to sit down with a legend like that, I was almost like – stopping myself from pinching myself during the sit down because that's kind of just how I looked at it was like in awe. And then I think about the guys that I played with that are kind of were like, that was like Matt holiday was one of those guys that literally you, you do not want to see him pull something as hard as he could because you had to watch out for your life. Like watch that your lips. was yep. one of those, watch, yeah, watch your lips. That's one of those guys. I think about even, even their smaller guys that, maybe not the same build, but even a Fernando Tatis, like watching him play, his hands are so quick that if he pulls something at the miles per hour exit below, like you better watch out. There's guys that are like that. And I've also, the last one um, I played with in Miami was Giancarlo Stanton. Like he, he, those are the types of players that when they touch the baseball, it is just a different sound and it's just a different flight off the bat and you really have to stand in awe sometimes because it, there's not a lot of guys that come come across that are like that. Oh man, such good stuff. Talking to Xavier Scruggs here on Ben and Woods this morning. I want to ask a question of you as somebody again that played at the highest level, you're around the game, you know a lot of people in the game. Does culture breed winning or does winning breed culture? Because I think here in San Diego, uh, Xavier, watching this team as closely as we have over the last few years, we've seen what we perceived was really, really good culture, um, but they didn't win much. Then, you know, you hear rumors of this and that, 
and and they win. And you're like, what the hell's going on here? And, and you know, you lose a, a guy in the lineup like Juan Soto, but many people are saying, oh, I expect, you know, maybe that will be bring the team closer together. I have no idea. I've never been in those locker rooms other than to, you know, report on stuff. But in your opinion, being around the game as long as you have, what's kind of your take on, on the whole culture situation in baseball? Yeah, I think that the, the it can kind of go either way, but I look at one thing that we may discount is kind of going through adversity too. I think that breeds an opportunity for success. Um, and I think that's what you'll see the Padres kind of go through this season, knowing that they had so much star power last year and weren't able to put it together. Okay, what can we do from the start that'll give us a different outlook on our season? I think that's going to be a focus for them. Um, and I think that they have to understand that they have to build a foundation of culture amongst themselves. Like a, a lot of times we look to a certain figure to do it, right? It may be a, a certain bigger personality in the clubhouse, or maybe we think it's a bigger personality that should help breed a, a certain culture, but that may not be the case a lot of times. And having played, I can tell you that there's guys that maybe have no personality that seem to do a, a, an ability to – okay, I've watched this guy go about his business. Yeah. There's something that I should be doing that he's doing that can breed that type of confidence within our team. So I think there's just so many factors to it. But I will, what I will tell you is sometimes losing a big figure like a Juan Soto can rally a team to say, okay, let's prove that we didn't necessarily need this guy to be successful, right? And I think that there's you can use certain things as a chip on the shoulder like the frustration of last year to move into success in 2024. Talking to Xavier Skrunks here on uh, Ben and Woods. And what do you make of the slowdown right now in the free agent market in the off season? You had the early big signings, but now they're still, I mean, we're, I think today the Padres are packing their trucks yeah, and heading truck to day. Peoria. Yeah. So we are very close to spring training and you still have stars like Bellinger, Chapman, Snell, Montgomery, still unsigned. Some say like 20 of the top 50 free agents have not signed yet. This is a, a pretty slow market this offseason. What do you think the cause is of that, Xavier? Yeah, I think Boris is definitely one of the biggest causes of it, right? He's just not going to uh, give in. Um, I think that's a part of it. He's he's He uh, is a representative for a few of these guys. Um, but also I look at there's uncertainty with some of these guys that are at the top of – that were at the top of their game last year, right? You still, you still, Blake Snell was amazing last year, but there's always question marks about how deep he can go into games, how much, how many walks he'll give up. I love Blake Snell, but there's guys, you know, at the, in these front offices that are not willing to give him the money that he's looking for because of the inconsistencies within his career, right? And the ups and downs in which he's had. Um, we know when he's at the best, he's one of the best pitchers in all baseball, but we also have seen, the opposite side. So I think there's question marks there, the same with Cody Bellinger. And when you look at the top of the top, a lot of times that affects the other guys that are below them, right? And it may not just be starting pitchers um, b below a Blake Snell. It can be relief pitchers. We understood that, you know, Hader didn't sign for a while, so that affects a lot of the other relief pitchers and what their market looks like. So um, I think we're starting to see the trickle effect a little bit more now. Guys are starting to sign a little bit more and disregarding and, and figuring out more what their market looks like besides some of those big guys. But um, yeah, I think a lot of it was that, but also it wasn't a great free agent market to, to begin with. Um, a lot of great talent came from Japan and came from Korea too. So there was a lot of factors that kind of weighed in on why there was a slow market here in, in the U S. Now, before we let you go, Xavier, I've seen you uh, on your your podcast taking some swings, and it looks pretty solid. Anything left in the <laughs> tank as we are in the market? I know you played some left field as well. We are in desperate need of a left fielder. <laughs> and uh, Maybe yeah, you, they're, they're... you and left, Tony Gwynn Jr. in center, and we just call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I don't know if you should be signing up Tony Gwynn Jr. like that, but... <laughs> But what I will say is I will do my best to at least let Schilt know that if he needs a right-handed bat off the bench, I will be available. And especially with the minor leagues or, or with the minimum salary is now, I'll, I'll definitely take some of that. 
right hander. Sorry, man. We have way too many of those. We're actually in the hunt for a left handed <laughs> hitter. So if you see anybody, please send them our way. But we we certainly thank you for your time. I recommend everybody go check out the show and go podcast. Uh, also, the the stuff you did with your wife giving birth in Korea was spectacular. I was talking to my wife about it last night, and she basically said, "Look, if you were doing radio in Korea and I was having a baby, I would say." Have fun doing radio in Korea. I'll see you when you get back. Your wife actually went along for the trip, and you guys had your baby in Korea, and that is incredible. Yes, man. and that's one thing is as the Padres and Dodgers will open up in Korea, I, I've always – it's given me a reason to go back to those experiences as I'll go out there for opening day out there. And, and I, I want to give people an idea as to what baseball and the lifestyle is like out there. So I appreciate you checking that out. Great stuff. Xavier Scruggs, uh, really appreciate it. A lot of fun. Thank you for the conversation. No problem, guys. You guys take it easy. Xavier Scruggs, MLB analyst, uh, podcast host. and uh, Good insight, yes. Yeah. Poway. Poway. High school. That all, also County. where yeah. our Tony Gwynn Jr. happened to go to high school Correct. as well, I've been told. Yeah. Not just Xavier Scruggs. All right, let's take a time out. Uh, we still have a Rindle report coming out. Get some headlines. Uh, getting some reaction as to what what do the Padres have left to spend if they want to stand, now stay under the the luxury tax threshold, getting some early numbers in following the Wandy Peralta signing. We can discuss that as well. Coming up after a check of traffic here on 97.3 The Fan.
So doing some quick calculations. By the way, thanks again to Xavier Scruggs. That was, that was a fun conversation uh, for joining us. Hopefully Great we'll dude. get a chance to do that again. I would like to hear more about his time in Korea yeah. as well. Brought it up briefly there at the uh, end of the conversation. But it sounds like he's got some stories uh, from his time playing in the KBO. Uh, the signing of Wandy Peralta, and the official numbers aren't in, but reportedly a four-year, 16 million dollar deal with opt-outs galore uh for wandy peralta if you figure that that means a four million dollar per year luxury tax number according to spot track that would put the padres just over 210 million for their luxury tax number right now uh the threshold the the penalty threshold for 2024 is 237 million. What do we add again? That would be just over 210 million, which would still leave them about 27 million shy of penalties for the luxury tax. The actual payroll for the Padres would climb to about 153 total with 144 active payroll for the 2024 team. Got some uh, early returns. Whoa, what was that? My right? keys. Oh, got caught I he broke a glass or something. <laughs> Headphone. It's allowed. I was like, did he drop his martini <laughs> glass over there? Uh, you're seeing some 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 tweets roll in. Uh, some people are some. Here's where it stands. Some people are excited that the Padres did anything. So right, you fall in that camp of like, Guilty. yes, we're alive. We're do, we are <laughs> currently actively trying to win baseball games next year. Then I've seen some tweets, Benny, about the peripherals of Wandy Peralta. Not good. A lot of walks, a lot of home runs given up. Um, last season. Last season. The, the season before seasons was before. Pretty and... good. Also, they pitch in the Yankee Stadium. You know, that's Petco's probably a little bit more uh, pitcher friendly there. Um, walk rate a little bit high. Uh, yeah, hopefully that's something you can corral. I mean, the the pretty basic numbers, you look at his ERA, about a 2-5 ERA. Not bad. Not bad at all. But... Um, yeah, you know, it, it like anything remains to be seen. Uh, not sure where he's going to slot in, uh, but you know, when you when you think about the Padres bullpen as it stands, and I know we're all comfortable with it, and I wonder, are we comfortable with the Padres bullpen right now, Ben, because of the sheer volume of people that are down there, or is it because you feel like? Well, they're they're going to be really, really effective. I've seen people uh, tweeting, you know, hey, look, we get the game to the fifth inning, game's over. We got so many good arms. It doesn't really always work that way, as we we've, we've seen here. We've had that kind of scene before. Um, is it because of the sheer volume of players? Well, because Matsui is an un- unknown, and Wusuk goes an unknown at this point. Steven Wilson has his ups and downs, but is pretty solid. Uh, Robert Suarez has his ups and downs, but has good stuff. You know, it, it, there's there is a there's something to be said for having a stable of arms, and well, they yeah. definitely have that. Yeah, I mean, the great thing about having a Josh Hader is you know what you're getting for yeah. the most part. One of the more consistent ninth inning guys, dominant, not going to give up much. But when you have a deep bullpen, you know that probably three or four of those guys at any given moment are going to be pitching pretty well, which gives the manager a lot of options. Yeah. You know, you go with the hot hands and, you know... the. Guy, you know, you know how bullpens work. Almost every reliever is going to have good stretches and bad stretches. And if you have more guys who are going through good stretches, then anytime you're in a one run game, you can throw in someone you feel confident about. So I like the idea of a deep bullpen. I still wonder whether this is maybe the sign that the Padres are willing to deal, though, someone. And I mentioned Stephen Wilson because if I'm an opposing GM, who am I asking about? If I my bullpen is thin and stinks and I don't have a lot of money, I'm going to be looking for a player who's under team control, who's making the minimum, who has shown good stuff. And Stephen Wilson is one of them. Can I interest you in an Adrian Morehound? Not as much. Oh, okay. Not as much. He makes a little bit more. I thought I would throw that out there. He's, I mean, he's left-handed, which is interesting. But Wandy is left-handed, which gives the Padres more left-handed depth now than most teams. I wonder if Tom Cosgrove is someone, and he was fantastic last fantastic. season, and I know people are going to be mad that I even bring it up. Whenever a Padre starts but, to do good, you try to trade well, them. Well, do you believe that Tom <laughs> Cosgrove is a 175 ERA, sub-1 whip guy, or that that funkiness of the delivery is something that other teams may start to catch up on as they see him more often? And that his You're numbers sell high. His numbers are due for a regression. And if a team needs a left hander, you just added a left hander in your bullpen. Could you sell high on Tom Cosgrove in a package that brings you back 
something you do need, like an outfielder. That, I'm just throwing it out there. And I don't know how mad that would make everybody if Tom Cosgrove got traded. Loved watching him pitch Great. last season. Yep. But not someone that I necessarily project is going to be. This guy's uh, can't miss one of the great closers in baseball for the next 10 years. You can't possibly get rid of him. I think there's a good chance that Tom Cosgrove fooled some people in his first season and that he's due, not necessarily to fall off the, t- the map, but he's due to go back to being more of a you know three, four ERA middle sixth inning type guy as opposed but, to a strong setup reliever in major league baseball for the long run. I mean, I don't know that you can I don't know that you can say that with any certainty. No, of course not. Right. Nor I can mean, AJ probably, nor can anyone else. Yeah. But he was a candidate, my I would think, for a sell high cheap guy that other teams would be interested in but right now. You need to you need to keep the cheap guys. I mean, we're out here offering, <laughs> you know, sixteen million dollars. That's that's a fine pickup, and I'm certainly not mad at it. And, yes, it did scratch the itch of, hey, look, a transaction. But I think you need to try to keep those cats on your team as opposed to get rid of them and and signing guys like Wandy Peralta for $16 million. Uh, I know the opt-outs and all obviously, that. Obviously, but. but they've already signed Wandy Peralta. So, yeah. you know, that, that, He's here. That, that horse is out of the barn or in the barn or whatever. I don't even know that that's a saying. I'm not sure either. Let's put let's, the toothpaste back the in the tube. Let's the barn door after the toothpaste is out of the tube. Yeah. Um, I am looking the horse back in the tube. Again, I'm looking at this. It's easy to, it's easy to make trades when you want to trade the players that you're not that big a fan of for players you like on other teams. Well, and also the I guys that are making the most money yes, for the guys, for the guys making, least making the least money. Sure. I'm looking at it because other GMs want cheap guys, and they're not going to give up their valuable players without something in return. So I'm trying to look at this from another team's perspective, and I'm looking at the Padres roster, and boy, I don't have any lefties in my bullpen, and I don't have any money to spend. Is there anyone out there that's available? Who would trade a left-handed reliever who's cheap and controllable right now? Well, the Padres, they just signed Wandy Petralta. They they just signed that uh, that reliever from Asia. He's left-handed, too. I wonder if they'd be willing to talk about Tom Cosgrove right now. He had a really good season. I mean, what if he could do that for our team next year? I've got surplus outfielders that are fairly affordable. They might mean – I just – this is how the kind of the discussion in my head – imagines a trade shaping up in major league baseball. Yeah, I, I think that's that's fair, but I I do, you know, there is something to be said for keeping young controllable guys and of not and, and not signing. And and again, I don't, you know, the Matsui deal didn't break the bank, neither did the Wusuk Go deal. They weren't they weren't massive massive. But I assume deals. you're not trading any of the guys you just signed Correct. to free agents. Correct. So, they're here. Who is possibly, if you have a surplus in the bullpen, who could possibly be traded? And it's easy to say Adrian Morey home. Yeah, of course. But that's 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 a you got to give something to get. You got to give something to get get something. I can't think that there's a lot of teams out there that are salivating over the possibility of Adrian Morey home right now. Sure. I mean, you know, you've seen guys way worse than Adrian Morey home get uh, get multiple chances truly i mean it, it, it left-handed pitcher in the big leagues that can throw in the in the 90s you're going to get some looks still so uh we said it early in this early in the off season that this is such a pivotal year for him uh and and the next step of his career so uh i don't know i i don't know but i i again i think that i was it was nice to see them do something obviously there's a lot more to be done but yeah you're gonna now with the with that many arms down the bullpen you got to think they have a little bit of a surplus that they can deal from uh, Jeff in the chat says Morahon from Manoa feels like something both sides. Um, and not 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 saying it's impossible. I I would guess that the Blue Jays are still trying to oversell Manoa as someone who was really good a couple of years ago and is trying to get a little bit more for him than That's what I'd be doing. <laughs> but well, considering how hard it is to find starting pitching right now, and I'd probably want more than that, but. I'm not saying that's impossible, and and Manoa definitely remains someone I think is on the Padres' radar as, as someone they'd be looking at for the right price. I will say this: the other reason I would keep Tom Cosgrove in case Wandy Wandy Peralta opts out after the first year because he has a really good season. And you have so, Cosgrove under control for many years. Yeah, I just keep I keep okay. those I keep those young controllable lefties uh, as much as I can. That's it. You're not wrong. All right, let's take a break. Uh, paulie has got some headlines to wrap things up in our final segment. The Rindle Report coming up next on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
Sarah Bennett Woods is brought to you by the Farmer's Dog. We've been talking about the Padres signing of free agent left-handed relief pitcher, Wandy Peralta. Did not have relief pitcher signing on my radar for today. No, I didn't either. Which keeps uh, very in line with A.J. Preller's philosophy of let's keep doing surprising things over and over again on your toes definitely have to stay on your toes when it comes to aj preller you never know what direction you think he's going to zig and then he zags zags. uh kevin ac in his uh latest four minutes ago piece that just dropped uh he says the team is also seeking another veteran starter Hyunjin Ryu, maybe. He does not mention that, but that's the one that you keep seeing mentioned uh, next to the Padres. Makes some sense. Don't Throwing know well. Returned from surgery late last season. Just threw, what, like 40, 50 innings. Yep. Not a ton, but looked decent yep. and continues to throw in this offseason. And, you know, if he goes back to, I mean, he had some good years with the Dodgers especially. He was he was good at some point. So, yeah, he's a, he's a possibility. But we already knew they were looking for another starter. Yep. And stunningly, they are also looking for outfielders, I'm told. And probably another reliever or two. That, that see, now that I was not expecting. I was not either. Thought you're pretty good at reliever. But then again, last year in spring training, I thought, yeah, they're pretty set in the starting rotation. Michael Walker has been signed by the San Diego Padres. Yep. Oh, okay. Turned out that worked out pretty pretty well for the Padres, actually. Indeed. So. All right, Paulie's uh, kept him. Paulie's standing by. We'll get some uh, headlines here on the Roundel Report right after a check. Traffic. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Traffic is sponsored by Vaveline Instant Draft Through Oil Change, your 15-minute instant draft through oil change. Problems in the North County, crash blocking lanes on South on 15 at Old Highway 395. Also eastbound 78 before Nordahl Road, stalled semi in middle lanes up ahead for the 15 vehicle down the right shoulder embankment. Still clearing crash the coastline, south on 5 before Cannon, everything's over the right shoulder. Westbound 54 just past Rayo Drive, collision over the right shoulder and an accident has cleared on northbound 5 at the eastbound 54 connector. Stop by any of the 30 San Diego Valvoline Instant Drive Through Oil Change Centers. You don't have to get out of your car, and it usually only takes 15 minutes or less. Visit SoCalOilChange.com for discounts. Locations nearest you, Valvoline Oil Change Centers, are open seven days a week. I'm Kelly Danik with Ben and Wood, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. And get things started here with our edition, today's edition oh, of boy. the Rindle Report. Now tuned into the Muff Greatest. Welcome to the Rindle Report with Paul Rindle. Hi, Paul. All right. Two stories from the world of sports that we haven't gotten to yet. We'll start off in Major League Baseball. And one story that you didn't know you needed. Are you laughing, Biot? It's the Rindle Report. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Okay, how are you? On 97.3 The Fan. Are you ready to bless the mood? I need some help, please. <laughs> that was good. Can I get a hoi? All right. All right. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to start off in the world of football. Not football. Football. And uh, talking about one of the biggest names in the sport, Neymar. I saw this headline on ESPN this morning. Now, I uh, do not condone online bullying, but I do like it when an athlete will clap back. <laughs> I like the clap back as well. I love the clap Very back. Very much. So, ben doesn't clap back much, and I wish he did. And I like to do it. Not like that. Like, really go get him. So, Neymar is out for the rest of the season. He suffered a knee injury back in October. And while he's recovering, he went and attended a 58th birthday party for a soccer player who I don't know their last name, so I'm just going to skip it, in Rio de Janeiro. Player Solid X. preparation and reporting. There. <laughs> yeah. You well, knew that was coming. When I first went through the story, I was like, oh, Ronaldo. And I'm like, nope, not Ronaldo. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, pictures of Neymar surfaced okay. at the birthday party, and uh, people went and went to the comments and noticed that they thought he had put on weight. Oh. Some even posted fake pictures of Neymar with a much bigger body. And he didn't like that, so he went on Instagram to his, by the way, uh, 218 million <laughs> followers. <laughs> and he posted a video to his story. And it's him, and he's walking, he's got the phone out, he says, finished training today, I've put on beauty weight. But fat? Nah. And he 
lifted the shirt, just and shredded. he ended the uh, he ended the video by giving everybody a middle finger, and he said, "Suck it, haters." I love it. <laughs> That's fantastic. You're not gonna take a finely tuned athlete like Neymar and start to body shame him, are you? Yeah, People I, really do that. I, even the athletes that are a tad heavier, yeah, really stay away from that. They're professional athletes. You're not. Uh, I even saw someone in our chat was going, Trent Grisham looks like he's put on some weight. I haven't seen what? any pictures I, of Trent Grisham. Like, I have no idea where, are you where going Trent with Grisham this? is. Where are you going with this? I don't understand. Men commenting on other men's bodies. Obviously, Tony Gwynn got it a lot, yeah. especially at the end of his career. It's weird, man. But It's weird. I get it. I've gotten it. It sucks. Never fun to see. I'm not going to cast any stones. Well, I know what drop it feels Next like time you get it, just lift your shirt up like Neymar and say, suck yeah, it, haters. Here, suck it, haters. <laughs> but I know what it feels like Give to the be bird. on the other end of that. So do your shirt again. Not going to do my shirt again. <laughs> All right. Moving over to the NFL. Saw this yesterday from a Dallas Cowboys beat reporter. It says, Jerry Jones said the Cowboys are going all in. It's about time. 2024. <laughs> Quote, we will be going all in. I would say that you will see us this coming year, not build it for the future. What? And I go, finally. As opposed to every other year when you're finally. always in the mix on every Those single Dallas free agent. Cowboys, long known for the playing the long game and never going after the star <sighs> players or trying to win right now. They're finally Bro, going all in to win now. It's what happens when you see the light. Well, the <laughs> darkness at the end of the tunnel. You know that your days are numbered, and you're like, I got him. My glory days, glory hole, so far behind. There it was. Yeah. Glory hole. There they were. Glory days. So <laughs> far behind him. So far behind him, Betty. Like I mean, I was. They're all in every year. I was. There's a, very few NFL teams that aren't all in every I, year. I was like a kid when they were winning Super Bowls and, and being dominant. We make fun, but is there any fan out there who wouldn't love their team owner? Well, I think. Barrett could send a. Picked up the phone right now and said, hey, we're, all, we're in. all in this year. We all go, yes, we're all in. Yeah. Like, cool. Can you sign anybody that is not a relief pitcher? Then? Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I don't know what your third story is, but did you see the breaking news this morning about our beloved Las Vegas and the Sphere? No. The next... Is it official? It's official. The next artist taking Other over than the Sphere. Fish. No, no, Fish is not playing the Sphere, I don't think, are yeah, they? Yeah, they are. Oh, they are. But the, they got the, like four dates. I, yeah, they have four dates. The next uh, one after that, they're going really staying in that jam band route. They're going with the Grateful Dead. Okay, they've been rumored. Yep, and oh my God, they did the sphere with the dead logo on it, and it looks unbelievable. I'd go to that. Would you? Yeah. Would I you? Mean, I, there's you really, just want to go to the sphere. There's nobody. I there's really few artists I wouldn't see at the sphere. What is it going to smell like in there? Marijuana cigarettes. Yeah. It says concert. in 2023, my Dead and God. Company played their final tour. But there are other ways to make sure the music never stops. Hmm. And it's going to be a ball. Get it? A ball. And there's the sphere. It lights sphere. up. And it's the dead. Best logo in music history. The skull with the lightning bolt goes up around the sphere. And it That's looks awesome. in. I just retweeted it. It's going to be it. very psychedelic. It <laughs> is going to be. Oh, God. You're going to have people losing their minds It's going to be there. a cloud. I would have medics Vegas. standing by. Uh, they do. In the sphere, they do, that, and they whatever's will. going on there. Holy smokes, man! <laughs> well, Dead and company. I do have a third story that's kind of in line with uh, the Grateful Dead, I suppose. There is a 39 year old woman in Colorado. Like, I did not find this story on one of my favorite subreddits, Not the Onion, but it belongs on Not the Onion. A 39 uh, year old woman in Colorado named Crystal Gable just found out that she's apparently running for president. Oh. She doesn't want to be running for president, but she is. Somebody signed her up? Yeah, she... Can you do that? It's a good bit. she do that to Ben. <laughs> she never planned <laughs> to run. Like, she's not happy about this in the slightest. She's on the ballot in Minnesota's primary, and she is running as the, quote, legal marijuana now party candidate. And she is a marijuana activist okay. in Colorado. And she has ran for a much smaller political offices before. Sure, she's decided they, she's running for president now, now against her she will. She just found out about this. She found out because 
she used to be in that party's Facebook group. Okay. And they nominated her without her permission. <laughs> they just assumed she'd be cool with it. She doesn't even check the Facebook group anymore, the Legal Marijuana Now Facebook group. And she found out because she has a Google alert set up for her name. And she saw that Crystal Gable running for president. And so Minnesota's primary is on March 5th. It's too late to get herself off of the ballot. So she is now campaigning and actively telling people, don't vote for me, please. See, anti-campaign. None of the above. Yeah, don't don't vote for me. It's the old, what is it? Uh, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Will not serve, yeah. Man. I didn't know you could, like, just nominate someone for president. And, like, they have no choice about it. You're now on the ballot, running I for president. No idea. I would really, Whether you like it or not. I would really like to put you on the ballot. Because <laughs> you would actually get my vote. Thanks. Okay. still have to do this show, though. Sorry. I would absolutely do both. Uh, somebody hands you your little portfolio after the show. Of, the nuclear football right yeah, here as yeah. I'm doing the show. Yeah, it'd be great. And then I get on Air Force One, like, right after yeah. 10 o'clock. Probably go play back. golf. Yeah, let's be honest with you. You would play more golf than Trump and everybody combined. I mean, they the get best on good courses. courses. Yeah, the they best get on really course. good courses. That would be the one thing that you would... can work while golfing. I mean, you know, I don't, you I don't can't. Ever have a huge problem about. But that. you can't, can't work. No, other people can. You would I be can't. narrating your shots for the whole world to see. Right, <laughs> it'd be tough. Thank you, Paulie. Very welcome. Uh, I have a minor, like, last Rindle Report story okay. I wanted to mention just because uh, last night, so I was watching the Aztecs game, and when it was over, I turned on Channel 10, and Celebrity Wheel of Fortune was on. Joe Buck was one of the contestants. Oh, yes. He got his doors blown off. No, he did not. By Coach Beard. Oh, from, from Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso, who was one of the best I see it. non or regular celebrity, like, Wheel of Fortune contestants I've ever seen. So they get to play twice. It's a whole hour. He won both games, both both bonus games, almost won the million. I think he ended up winning like $500,000 for his charity. He solved everything. He was really You remember the, really the puzzles? I, I remember a couple of the puzzles, but um, I should have known, I think was the bonus game that he won on the last one was the, the, the puzzle. Uh, but he was really Really smart. Seems Brent, like a sharp Brendan dude. something was his yeah, name, the Brendan. actor's name. But he was very sharp. And Joe was like, I did not know. Brendan I was, Hunt. I did not know I was going to come on this show and get absolutely <laughs> smoked and embarrassed by someone. I think Joe thought, uh, Celebrity Will of Fortune, I'm going to do fairly well on this. And he was like, nope, you are not going to do well at all on this program. Before we get out of here, fill me in on what's going on in golf. I've been getting texts about it. What's what's uh, happening? So they, they just announced they had the players meeting, a big Zoom with all the players, and they have officially landed a $3 billion deal. Ooh. Not with the Saudi, not with the PIF, but this is with the Strategic Sports Group, the cabal of owners, like East Coast sports owners, like um, Cohen and... Grousebeck, who owns the Celtics and the uh, Boston Red Sox owners, and they're investing a ton of money into golf. And essentially, they're making it so the players are like stakeholders. Like the longer you're oh, on tour, the more of this equity you get. Ooh. Like, you know, Tiger probably now owns 5% of the PGA Tour. So the rich get richer, our... is what you're yes. saying. Yeah, cool. And I don't know awesome. that it's going to affect our watching or viewing experience. It doesn't bring any of the live golfers back. That's still to be negotiated, but. Hey, if you are a professional golfer listening right now, congratulations on your riches. Yeah, well done. Good for Good you. Good for you. All right, Annie and Elston coming up next. For Polly, for Woods, I'm Ben. Have a great rest of your Wednesday from all of us here at 97.3 The Fan.